Foundation's Edge by Isaac Asimov, read by Larry McKeever. Chapter 8, Farm Woman. 26. The speakers sat about the table, frozen in their metal shielding. It was as though all, with one accord, had hidden their minds to avoid irrevocable insult to the first speaker after his statement concerning Trevise. Surreptitiously they glanced toward Delarmy, and even that gave her way much. Of them all, she was best known for her irreverence. Even Gendebal paid more lip service to convention. Delarmy was aware of the glances, and she knew that she had no choice but to face up to this impossible situation. In fact, she did not want to duck the issue. In all the history of the Second Foundation, no first speaker had ever been impeached for misanalysis, and behind the term, which she had invented as cover-up, was the unacknowledged incompetence. Such impeachment now became possible. She would not hang back. First speaker, she said softly, her thin, colorless lips more nearly invisible than usual in the general whiteness of her face, you yourself say you have no basis for your opinion, that the psychohistorical mathematics show nothing. Do you ask us to base a crucial decision on a mystical feeling? The first speaker looked up, his forehead corrugated. He was aware of the universal shielding at the table. He knew what it meant. He said coldly, I do not hide the lack of evidence. I present you with nothing falsely. What I offer is the strongly intuitive feeling of a first speaker, one with decades of experience who has spent nearly a lifetime in the close analysis of the Selden plan. He looked about him with a proud rigidity he rarely displayed, and one by one the mental shields softened and dropped. Delarmy's, when he turned to stare at her, was the last. She said with a disarming frankness that filled her mind as though nothing else had ever been there, I accept your statement, of course, first speaker. Nevertheless, I think you might perhaps want to reconsider. As you think about it now, having already expressed shame at having to fall back on intuition, would you wish your remarks to be stricken from the record, if in your judgment they should be? And Gendebal's voice cut in. What are these remarks that should be stricken from the record? Every pair of eyes turned in unison. Had their shields not been up during the crucial moments before, they would have been aware of his approach long before he was at the door. All shields up a moment ago, all unaware of my entrance, said Gendebal sardonically. What a commonplace meeting of the table we have here. Was no one on their guard for my coming, or did you all fully expect that I would not arrive? This outburst was a flagrant violation of all standards. For Gendebal to arrive late was bad enough. For him to then enter unannounced was worse. For him to speak before the first speaker had acknowledged his attendance was worst of all. The first speaker turned to him. All else was superseded. The question of discipline came first. Speaker Gendebal, he said, you are late. You arrive unannounced. You speak. Is there any reason why you should not be suspended from your seat for thirty days? Of course. The move for suspension should not be considered until we first consider who it was that made it certain I would be late and why. Gendebal's words were cool and measured, but his mind clothed his thoughts with anger, and he did not care who sensed it. Certainly, Delarmy sensed it. She said forcefully, This man is mad. Mad? This woman is mad to say so, or aware of guilt. First speaker, I address myself to you and move a point of personal privilege, said Gendebal. Personal privilege of what nature, speaker? First speaker, I accuse someone here of attempted murder. The room exploded as every speaker rose to his or her feet in a simultaneous babble of words, expressions, and mentality. The first speaker raised his arms. He cried, the speaker must have his chance to express his point of personal privilege. He found himself forced to intensify his authority mentally in a manner most inappropriate to the place, yet there was no choice. The babel quieted. Gendebal waited unmoved until the silence was both audibly and mentally profound. He said, On my way here, moving along a Hamish road at a distance and approaching at a speed that would have easily assured my arrival in good time for the meeting, I was stopped by several farmers and narrowly escaped being beaten, perhaps being killed. As it was, I was delayed and have but just arrived. May I point out to begin with that I know of no instance since the great sack that a second foundationer has been spoken to disrespectfully, let alone manhandled, by one of these Hamish people. Nor do I, said the first speaker. Delarmy cried out, Second foundationers do not habitually walk alone in Hamish territory. You invite this by doing so. It is true said Gendebal, that I habitually walk alone in Hamish territory. I have walked there hundreds of times in every direction, yet I have never been accosted before. Others do not walk with the freedom that I do, but no one exiles himself from the world or imprisons himself in the university, and no one has ever been accosted. I recall occasions when Delarmy, 
And then, as though remembering the honorific too late, he deliberately converted it into a deadly insult. I mean to say, I recall when Speaker S. Delarmy was in Hamish territory at one time or another, and yet she was not accosted. Perhaps, said Delarmy, with eyes widened into a glare, because I did not speak to them first, and because I maintained my distance, because I behaved as though I deserved respect, I was accorded it. Strange, said Jendibal, and I was about to say that it was because you presented a more formidable appearance than I did. After all, few dare approach you even here. But tell me, why should it be that of all times for interference the Hamish would choose this day to face me when I am to attend an important meeting of the table? If it were not because of your behavior, then it must have been chance, said Delarmy. I have not heard that even all of Selden's mathematics has removed the role of chance from the galaxy, certainly not in the case of individual events. Or are you, too, speaking from intuitional inspiration? There was a soft mental sigh from one or two speakers at this sideways thrust at the first speaker. It was not my behavior. It was not chance. It was deliberate interference, said Jendibal. How can we know that? asked the first speaker gently. He could not help but soften toward Jendibal as a result of Delarmy's last remark. My mind is open to you, first speaker. I give you and all the table my memory of events. The transfer took but a few moments. The first speaker said, Shocking. You behave very well, speaker, under circumstances of considerable pressure. I agree that the Hamish behavior is anomalous and warrants investigation. In the meantime, please join our meeting. A moment, cut in Delarmy. How certain are we that the speaker's account is accurate? Jendibal's nostrils flared at the insult, but he retained his level composure. My mind is open. I have known open minds that were not open. I have no doubt of that, Speaker, said Jendibal, since you, like the rest of us, must keep your own mind under inspection at all times. My mind, when open, however, is open. The first Speaker said, Let us have no further... A point of personal privilege, First Speaker, with apologies for the interruption, said Delarmy. Personal privilege of what nature, Speaker? Speaker Jendibal has accused one of us of attempted murder, presumably by instigating the farmer to attack him. As long as the accusation is not withdrawn, I must be viewed as a possible murderer, as would every person in this room, including you, First Speaker. The First Speaker said, Would you withdraw the accusation, Speaker Jendibal? Jendibal took his seat and put his hands down upon its arms, gripping them tightly as though taking ownership of it, and said, I will do so as soon as someone explains why a Hamish farmer, rallying several others, should deliberately set out to delay me on my way to this meeting. A thousand reasons, perhaps, said the first speaker. I repeat that this event will be investigated. Will you, for now, Speaker Jendibal, and in the interest of continuing the present discussion, withdraw your accusation? I cannot, first speaker. I spent long minutes trying, as delicately as I might, to search his mind for ways to alter his behavior without damage, and failed. His mind lacked the give it should have had. His emotions were fixed, as though by an outside mind. Delarmy said with a sudden little smile, and you think one of us was the outside mind? Might it not have been your mysterious organization that is competing with us, that is more powerful than we are? It might, said Jendibal. In that case, we who are not members of this organization that only you know of are not guilty, and you should withdraw your accusation. Or can it be that you are accusing someone here of being under the control of this strange organization? Perhaps one of us here is not quite what he or she seems. Perhaps said Jendibal stolidly, quite aware that Delarmy was feeding him rope with a noose at the end of it. It might seem, said Delarmy, reaching the noose and preparing to tighten it, that your dream of a secret, unknown, hidden, mysterious organization is a nightmare of paranoia. It would fit in with your paranoid fantasy that Hamish farmers are being influenced, that speakers are under hidden control. I am willing, however, to follow this peculiar thought line of yours for a while longer. Which of us here, speaker, do you think is under control? Might it be me? Jendibal said, I would not think so, Speaker. If you were attempting to rid yourself of me in so indirect a manner, you would not so openly advertise your dislike for me. A double-double cross, perhaps, said Delarmy. She was virtually purring. That would be a common conclusion in a paranoid fantasy. So it might be. You are more experienced in such matters than I. Speaker Lestim Gianni interrupted hotly. See here, Speaker Jendibal, if you are exonerating Speaker Delarmy, you are directing your accusations the more tightly at the rest of us. What grounds would any of us have to delay your presence at this meeting, let alone wish you dead? Jandibal answered quickly, as though he had been waiting for the question. 
When I entered, the point under discussion was the striking of remarks from the record, remarks made by the first speaker. I was the only speaker not in a position to hear those remarks. Let me know what they were, and I rather think I will tell you the motive for delaying me. The first speaker said, I had stated, and it was something to which Speaker Delarmy and others took serious exception, that I had decided, on the basis of intuition and of a most inappropriate use of psychohistorical mathematics, that the entire future of the plan may rest on the exile of First Foundationer Golan Trevise. Genoval said, What other speakers may think is up to them. For my part, I agree with this hypothesis. Trevise is the key. I find his sudden ejection by the First Foundation too curious to be innocent. Delarmy said, would you care to say, Speaker Gendebal, that Trevise is in the grip of this mystery organization, or that the people who exiled him are? Is perhaps everyone and everything in their control except you and the first speaker, and me, whom you have declared to be uncontrolled? Gendebal said, These ravings require no answer. Instead, let me ask if there is any speaker here who would like to express agreement on this matter with the first speaker and myself. You have read, I presume, the mathematical treatment that I have, with the first speaker's approval circulated among you. There was silence. I repeat my request, said Gendebal. Anyone? There was silence. Gendebal said, First Speaker, you now have the motive for delaying me. The First Speaker said, State it explicitly. You have expressed the need to deal with Trevise, with this First Foundationer. It represents an important initiative and policy, and if the speakers had read my treatment, they would have known in a general way what was in the wind. If nevertheless they had unanimously disagreed with you, unanimously, then by traditional self-limitation you would have been unable to go forward. If even one speaker backed you, then you would be able to implement this new policy. I was the one speaker who would back you, as anyone who had read my treatment would know, and it was necessary that I must at all costs be kept from the table. That trick proved nearly successful, but I am now here, and I back the first speaker. I agree with him, and he can, in accordance with tradition, disregard the disagreement of the ten other speakers. Delarmy struck the table with her fist. The implication is that someone knew in advance what the first speaker would advise, knew in advance that Speaker Gendebal would support it, and that all the rest would not, that someone knew what he could not have known. There is the further implication that this initiative is not to the liking of Speaker Gendebal's paranoia-inspired organization, and that they are fighting to prevent it, and that, therefore, one or more of us is under the control of that organization. The implication is there, agreed Gendebal. Your analysis is masterly. Whom do you accuse? cried out Delarney. No one. I call upon the first speaker to take up the matter. It is clear that there is someone in our organization who is working against us. I suggest that everyone working for the second foundation should undergo a thorough mental analysis, everyone, including the speakers themselves, even including myself and the first speaker. The meeting of the table broke up in greater confusion and greater excitement than any on record. And when the first speaker finally spoke the phrase of adjournment, Gendebal, without speaking to anyone, made his way back to his room. He knew well that he had not one friend among the speakers, that even whatever support the first speaker could give him would be half-hearted at best. He could not tell whether he feared for himself or for the entire second foundation. The taste of doom was sour in his mouth. 27. Gendebal did not sleep well. His waking thoughts and his sleeping dreams were alike engaged in quarreling with Dolora Delarmy. In one passage of one dream, there was even a confusion between her and the Hamish farmer Rufirant, so the Gendebal found himself facing an out-of-proportion Delarmy, advancing upon him with enormous fists and a sweet smile that revealed needle-like teeth. He finally woke later than usual, with no sensation of having rested, and with the buzzer on his night table in muted action. He turned over to bring his hand down upon the contact. Yes, what is it? Speaker, the voice was that of the floor proctor, rather less than suitably respectful. A visitor wishes to speak to you. A visitor? Gendebal punched his appointment schedule, and the screen showed nothing before noon. He pushed the time button. It was 8.32 a.m. He said peevishly, Who in space and time is it? Well, not give a name, Speaker. Then, with clear disapproval, One of these Hamishers, Speaker, arrived at your invitation. The last sentence was said with even clearer disapproval. Let him wait in the reception room till I come down. It will take time. Gendebal did not hurry. Throughout the morning ablutions, he remained lost in thought. That someone was using the Hamish to hamper his movements made sense, but he would like to know who that someone was, and what was this new intrusion of the Hamish into his very quarters? A complicated trap of some sort? How in the name of Selden would a Hamish farmer get into the university? What reason could he advance? What reason could he really have? 
For one fleeting moment, Jendabal wondered if he ought to arm himself. He decided against it almost at once, since he felt contemptuously certain of being able to control any single farmer on the university grounds without any danger to himself, and without any unacceptable marking of a Hamish mind. Jendabal decided he had been too strongly affected by the incident with Carol Rufferant the day before. Was it the very farmer, by the way? No longer under the influence, perhaps, of whatever or whoever it was, he might well have come to Jendabal to apologize for what he had done, and with apprehension of punishment. But how would Rufferant know where to go, whom to approach? Jendabal swung down the corridor resolutely and entered the waiting room. He stopped in astonishment, then turned to the proctor, who was pretending to be busy in his glass-walled cubicle. Proctor, you did not say the visitor was a woman. The proctor said quietly, Speaker, I said a Hamisher. You did not ask further. Minimal information, Proctor. I must remember that as one of your characteristics. And he must check to see if the proctor was a Delarmy appointee. And he must remember from now on to note the functionaries who surrounded him, lowlies, whom it was too easy to ignore from the height of his still new speakership. Are any of the conference rooms available? The proctor said, Number four is the only one available, Speaker. It will be free for three hours. He glanced briefly at the Hamish woman, then at Jendabal with blank innocence. We will use number four, Proctor, and I would advise you to mind your thoughts. Jendabal struck, not gently, and the Proctor's shield closed far too slowly. Jendabal knew well it was beneath his dignity to manhandle a lesser mind, but a person who was incapable of shielding an unpleasant conjecture against a superior ought to learn not to indulge in one. The Proctor would have a mild headache for a few hours. It was well deserved. 28. Her name did not spring immediately to mind, and Jendabal was in no mood to delve deeper. She could scarcely expect him to remember in any case. He said peevishly, You are. I be no vi, Master Scowler, she said in what was almost a gasp. My previous be Sura, but I be called Novi Plain. Yes, Novi, we met yesterday. I remember now. I have not forgotten that you came to my defense. He could not bring himself to use the Hamish accent on the very university grounds. Now, how did you get here? Master, you said I might write letter. You said it should say, Speaker's House, Apartment 27. I self bring it, and I show the writing, my own writing, Master. She said it with a kind of bashful pride. They ask, for whom be this writing? I heard your calling when you said it, that oafish baintop roofirant. I say it be for store gendable, Master Scholar. And they let you pass, Novi? Didn't they ask to see the letter? I'd be very frightened. I think maybe they feel gentle sorry. I said, Scowler Jendabal promised to show me place of scowlers. And they smile. One of them at gate door say to other, and that not all he be show her. And they show me where to go, and they say not to go else place at all, or I'd be thrown out moment-wise. Jendabal reddened faintly. I seldom, if he felt the need for Hamish amusement, it would not be in so open a fashion, and his choice would have been made more selectively. He looked at the Trantorian woman with an inward shake of his head. She seemed quite young, younger perhaps than hard work had made her appear. She could not be more than twenty-five, at which age Hamish women were usually already married. She wore her dark hair in the braids that signified her to be unmarried, virginal in fact, and he was not surprised. Her performance yesterday showed her to have enormous talent as a shrew, and he doubted that a Hamishman could easily be found who would dare be yoked to her tongue and her ready fist. Nor was her appearance much of an attraction. Though she had gone to pains to make herself look presentable, her face was angular and plain, her hands red and knobby. What he could see of her figure seemed built for endurance rather than for grace. Her lower lip began to tremble under his scrutiny. He could sense her embarrassment and fright quite plainly and felt pity. She had indeed been of use to him yesterday, and that was what counted. He said, in an attempt to be genial and soothing, So you have come to see the uh, place of scholars? She opened her dark eyes wide. They were rather fine, and said, Master, be not ironed with me, but I come to be scholar own self. You want to be a scholar? Jendabal was thunderstruck. My good woman! He paused. How on Tranter could one explain to a completely unsophisticated farm woman the level of intelligence, training, and mental stamina required to be what Trantorians called a scowler? But Sura Novi drove on fiercely. I be a writer and a reader. I have read whole books to end and from beginning, too, and I have wished to be scowler. I do not wish to be farmer's wife. I be no person for farm. I would not wed farmer or have farmer children. She lifted her head and said proudly, I be asked. Many times I always say nay, politely, but nay. 
Jendabal could see plainly enough that she was lying. She had not been asked, but he kept his face straight. He said, What will you do with your life if you do not marry? Novi brought her hand down on the table, palm flat. I will be scholar. I not be farm woman. What if I cannot make you a scholar? Then I be nothing, and I wait to die. I be nothing in life if I be not a scholar. For a moment there was the impulse to search her mind and find out the extent of her motivation. But it would be wrong to do so. A speaker did not amuse oneself by rummaging through the helpless minds of others. There was a code to the science and technique of mental control, mentalics, as to other professions. Or there should be. He was suddenly regretful he had struck out at the proctor. He said, Why not be a farm woman, Novi? With a little manipulation, he could make her content with that and manipulate some Hamish lout into being happy to marry her and she to marry him. It would do no harm. It would be a kindness. But it was against the law and thus unthinkable. She said, I not be. A farmer is a clod. He works with earth lumps and he becomes earth lump. If I be farm woman, I be earth lump too. I will be timeless to read and write and I will forget. My head, she put her hand to her temple, will grow sour and stale. No, a scholar be different, thoughtful. She meant by the word Jendabal noted intelligent rather than considerate. A scholar, she said, live with books and with, with I forget what they be name said. She made a gesture as though she were making some sort of vague manipulations that would have meant nothing to Jendabal if he did not have her mind radiations to guide him. Microfilms, he said. How do you know about microfilms? In books I read of many things, she said proudly. Jendabal could no longer fight off the desire to know more. This was an unusual Hamisher. He had never heard of one like this. The Hamish were never recruited. But if Novi were younger, say, ten years old... Ah, what a waste. He would not disturb her. He would not disturb her in the least. But of what use was it to be a speaker if one could not observe unusual minds and learn from them? He said, Novi, I want you to sit there for a moment. Be very quiet. Do not say anything. Do not think of saying anything. Just think of falling asleep. Do you understand? Her fright returned at once. Why must I do this, master? Because I wish to think how you might become a scholar. After all, no matter what she had read, there was no possible way in which she could know what being a scholar truly meant. It was therefore necessary to find out what she thought a scholar was. Very carefully and with infinite delicacy he probed her mind, sensing without actually touching, like placing one's hand on a polished metal surface without leaving fingerprints. To her, a scholar was someone who always read books. She had not the slightest idea of why one read books. For herself to be a scholar, the picture in her mind was that of doing the labor she knew, fetching, carrying, cooking, cleaning, following orders, but on the university grounds, where books were available, and where she would have time to read them, and very vaguely, to become learned. What it amounted to was that she wanted to be a servant, his servant. Jendabal frowned. A Hamish woman's servant, and one who was plain, graceless, uneducated, barely literate. Unthinkable. He would simply have to divert her. There would have to be some way of adjusting her desires, to make her content to be a farm woman, some way that would leave no mark, some way about which even Delarmy could not complain. Or had she been sent by Delarmy? Was all this a complicated plan to lure him into tampering with a Hamish mind so that he might be caught and impeached? Ridiculous. He was in danger of growing paranoid. Somewhere in the simple tendrils of her uncomplicated mind, a trickle of mental current needed to be diverted. It would only take a tiny push. It was against the letter of the law, but it would do no harm, and no one would ever notice. He paused. Back. 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 Space, he had almost missed it. Was he the victim of an illusion? No. Now that his attention was drawn to it, he could make it out clearly. There was the tiniest tendril disarrayed, an abnormal disarray, yet it was so delicate, so ramification-free. Jendabal emerged from her mind. He said gently, Novi. Her eyes focused. She said, Yes, master? Jendabal said, you may work with me. I will make you a scholar. Joyfully, eyes blazing, she said, Master! He detected it at once. She was going to throw herself at his feet. He put his hands on her shoulders and held her tightly. Don't move, Novi. Stay where you are. Stay. He might have been talking to a half-trained animal. When he could see the order had penetrated, he let her go. 
He was conscious of the hard muscles along her upper arms. He said, If you are to be a scholar, you must behave like one. That means you will have to be always quiet, always soft-spoken, always doing what I tell you to do. And you must try to learn to talk as I do. You will also have to meet other scholars. Will you be afraid? I be not afeard, uh, afraid, master, if you be with me. I will be with you. But now, first, I must find you a room, arrange to have you assigned a lavatory, a place in the dining room, and clothes, too. You will have to wear clothes more suitable to a scholar, Novi. Tease be all light, she began miserably. We will supply others. Clearly, he would have to get a woman to arrange for a new supply of clothing for Novi. He would also need someone to teach the Hamisher the rudiments of personal hygiene. After all, though the clothes she wore were probably her best, and though she had obviously spruced herself up, she still had a distinct odor that was faintly unpleasant. And he would have to make sure that the relationship between them was understood. It was always an open secret that the men, and women too, of the Second Foundation, made occasional forays among the Hamish for their pleasure. If there was no interference with Hamish minds in the process, no one dreamed of making a fuss about it. Jendabal had never indulged in this, and he liked to think it was because he felt no need for sex that might be coarser and more highly spiced than was available at the university. The women of the Second Foundation might be pallid in comparison to the Hamish, but they were clean, and their skins were smooth. But even if the matter were misunderstood and there were sniggers at a speaker who not only turned to the Hamish but brought one into his quarters, he would have to endure the embarrassment. As it stood, this farm woman, Suranovi, was his key to victory in the inevitable forthcoming duel with Speaker Delarmy and the rest of the table. 29. Gendebal did not see Novi again till after dinner time, at which time she was brought to him by the woman to whom he had endlessly explained the situation, at least the non-sexual character of the situation. She had understood, or at least did not dare show any indication of failure to understand, which was perhaps just as good. Novi stood before him now, bashful, proud, embarrassed, triumphant, all at once in an incongruous mixture. He said, You look very nice, Novi. The clothes they had given her fit surprisingly well, and there was no question that she did not look at all ludicrous. Had they pinched in her waist, lifted her breasts, or had that just been not particularly noticeable in her farmwoman clothing? Her buttocks were prominent, but not displeasingly so. Her face, of course, remained plain, but when the tan of outdoor life faded and she learned how to care for her complexion, it would not look downright ugly. By the old empire, that woman did think Novi was to be his mistress. She had tried to make her beautiful for him. And then he thought, well, why not? Novi would have to face the speaker's table, and the more attractive she seemed, the more easily he would be able to get his point across. It was with this thought that the message from the first speaker reached him. It had the kind of appropriateness that was common in a mentalic society. It was called, more or less informally, the coincidence effect. If you think vaguely of someone when someone is thinking vaguely of you, there is a mutual escalating stimulation, which in a matter of seconds makes the two thoughts sharp, decisive, and to all appearances simultaneous. It can be startling even to those who understand it intellectually, particularly if the preliminary vague thoughts were so dim on one side or the other, or both, as to have gone consciously unnoticed. I can't be with you this evening, Novi, said Gendebal. I have scholar work to do. I will take you to your room. There will be some books there, and you can practice your reading. I will show you how to use the signal if you need help with anything, and I will see you tomorrow. 30. Gendebal said politely, First speaker. Shandis merely nodded. He looked dour and fully his age. He looked as though he were a man who did not drink, but who could use a stiff one. He said finally, I called you. No messenger. I presumed from the direct call that it was important. It is. Your quarry, the first foundationer, Trevise. Yes. He is not coming to Trantor. Gendebal did not look surprised. Why should he? The information we received was that he was leaving with a professor of ancient history who was seeking Earth. Yes, the legendary primal planet. And that is why he should be coming to Trantor. After all, does the professor know where Earth is? Do you? Do I? Can we be sure it exists at all or ever existed? Surely they would have to come to this library to obtain the necessary information, if it were to be obtained anywhere. I have until this hour felt that the situation was not at crisis level, that the first foundationer would come here and that we would, through him, learn what we need to know which would certainly be the reason he is not allowed to come here. But where is he going, then? We have not yet found out, I see. The first speaker said pettishly, You seem calm about it. 
Gentleman said, I wonder if it is not better so. You want him to come to Trantor to keep him safe and use him as a source of information. Will he not, however, prove a source of more important information, involving others still more important than himself, if he goes where he wants to go and does what he wants to do, provided we do not lose sight of him? Not enough, said the first speaker. You have persuaded me of the existence of this new enemy of ours, and now I cannot rest. Worse, I have persuaded myself that we must secure treaties, or we have lost everything. I cannot rid myself of the feeling that he, and nothing else, is the key. Gendebal said intensely, Whatever happens, we will not lose, first speaker. That would only have been possible if these anti-mules, to use your phrase again, had continued to burrow beneath us unnoticed. But we know they are there now. We no longer work blind. At the next meeting of the table, if we can work together, we shall begin the counterattack. The first speaker said, It was not the matter of Trevise that had me send out the call to you. The subject came up first only because it seemed to me a personal defeat. I had misanalyzed that aspect of the situation. I was wrong to place personal pique above general policy, and I apologize. There is something else. More serious, first speaker? More serious, Speaker Gendebal. The first speaker sighed and drummed his fingers on the desk, while Gendebal stood patiently before it and waited. The first speaker finally said in a mild way, as though that would ease the blow, at an emergency meeting of the table initiated by Speaker Delarmy, without your consent, First Speaker, for what she wanted, she needed the consent of only three other speakers, not including myself. At the emergency meeting that was then called, you were impeached, Speaker Gendebal. You have been accused of being unworthy of the post of Speaker, and you must be tried. This is the first time in over three centuries that a bill of impeachment has been carried out against a Speaker. Gendebal said, fighting to keep down any sign of anger, Surely you did not vote for my impeachment yourself. I did not, but I was alone. The rest of the table was unanimous, and the vote was ten to one for impeachment. The requirement for impeachment, as you know, is eight votes, including the first speaker, or ten without him. But I was not present. You would not have been able to vote. I might have spoken in my defense. Not at that stage. The precedents are few but clear. Your defense will be at the trial, which will come as soon as possible, naturally. Gendebal bowed his head and thought. Then he said, This does not concern me overmuch, First Speaker. Your initial instinct, I think, was right. The matter of Trevise takes precedence. May I suggest you delay the trial on that ground? The First Speaker held up his hand. I don't blame you for not understanding the situation, Speaker. Impeachment is so rare an event that I myself have been forced to look up the legal procedures involved. Nothing takes precedence. We are forced to move directly to the trial, postponing everything else. Gendebal placed his fists on the desk and leaned toward the first speaker. You are not serious. It is the law. The law can't be allowed to stand in the way of a clear and present danger. To the table, Speaker Gendebal, you are the clear and present danger. No, listen to me. The law that is involved is based on the conviction that nothing can be more important than the possibility of corruption or the misuse of power on the part of a speaker. But I am guilty of neither first speaker, and you knew it. This is a matter of personal vendetta on the part of Speaker Delarmy. If there is misuse of power, it is on her part. My crime is that I have never labored to make myself popular. I admit that much. And I have paid too little attention to fools who are old enough to be senile, but young enough to have power. Like myself, Speaker? Gendebal sighed. You see, I've done it again. I don't refer to you, first speaker. Very well, then. Let us have an instant trial, then. Let us have it tomorrow. Better yet, tonight. Let us get it over with, and then pass on to the matter of Trevis, as we dare not wait. The first speaker said, Speaker Gendebal, I don't think you understand the situation. We have had impeachments before. Not many, just two. Neither of those resulted in a conviction. You, however, will be convicted. You will then no longer be a member of the table, and you will no longer have a say in public policy. You will not, in fact, even have a vote at the annual meeting of the Assembly. And you will not act to prevent that? I cannot. I will be voted down unanimously. I will then be forced to resign, which I think is what the speakers would like to see. And Delarmy will become first speaker? That is certainly a strong possibility. But that must not be allowed to happen. Exactly. Which is why I will have to vote for your conviction. Gendebal drew a deep breath. I still demand an instant trial. You must have time to prepare your defense. What defense? They will listen to no defense. Instant trial. The table must have time to prepare their case. 
They have no case and will want none. They have me convicted in their minds and will require nothing more. In fact, they would rather convict me tomorrow than the day after, and tonight rather than tomorrow. Put it to them. The first speaker rose to his feet. They faced each other across the desk. The first speaker said, Why are you in such a hurry? The matter of Trevise will not wait. Once you are convicted, and I am rendered feeble in the face of a table united against me, what will have been accomplished? Chendabal said in an intense whisper, Have no fears. Despite everything, I will not be convicted. Chapter 9. Hyperspace. 31. Trevise said, Are you ready, Janoff? Pellerat looked up from the book he was viewing and said, You mean for the jump, old fellow? For the hyperspatial jump, yes. Pellerat swallowed. Now, you're sure that it will be in no way uncomfortable. I know it's a silly thing to fear, but the thought of having myself reduced to incorporeal tachyons, which no one has ever seen or detected... <laughs> Come, Janov, it's a perfected thing, upon my honor. The jump has been in use for 22,000 years, as you explained, and I've never heard of a single fatality in hyperspace. We might come out of hyperspace in an uncomfortable place, but then the accident would happen in space, not while we are composed of tachyons. Small consolation, it seems to me. We won't come out in error, either. To tell you the truth, I was thinking of carrying it through without telling you, so that you would never know it had happened. On the whole, though, I felt it would be better if you experienced it consciously, saw that it was no problem of any kind, and could forget it totally henceforward. Well, said Pallorette dubiously, I suppose you're right, but honestly, I'm in no hurry. I assure you. No, no, old fellow, I accept your assurances unequivocally. It's just that... Did you ever read Santerestal Matt? Of course, I'm not illiterate. Certainly, certainly, I should not have asked. Do you remember it? Neither am I an amnesiac. I seem to have a talent for offending. All I mean is that I keep thinking of the scenes where Santerestal and his friend Ban have gotten away from Planet 17 and are lost in space. I think of those perfectly hypnotic scenes among the stars, lazily moving along in deep silence, in changelessness, in... Never believed it, you know. I loved it, and I was moved by it, but I never really believed it. But now, after I got used to just the notion of being in space, I'm experiencing it. And it's silly, I know, but I don't want to give it up. It's as though I'm Santorestal. And I'm Ban, said Trevise, with just an edge of impatience. In a way, the small scattering of dim stars out there are motionless, except our sun, of course, which must be shrinking, but which we don't see. The galaxy retains its dim majesty, unchanging. Space is silent, and I have no distractions. Except me. Except you. But then, Golan, dear chap, talking to you about Earth and trying to teach you a bit of prehistory has its pleasures, too. I, I don't want that to come to an end, either. It won't. Not immediately, at any rate. You don't suppose we'll take the jump and come through on the surface of a planet, do you? We'll still be in space, and the jump will have taken no measurable time at all. It may well be a week before we make surface of any kind, so do relax. By surface, you surely don't mean Gaia. We may be nowhere near Gaia when we come out of the jump. I know that, Janoff, but we'll be in the right sector if your information is correct. If it isn't, well... Pellerat shook his head glumly. How will being in the right sector help if we don't know Gaia's coordinates? Trevis said, Janoff, suppose you were on Terminus, heading for the town of Argyropol, and you didn't know where that town was except that it was somewhere on the Isthmus. Once you were on the Isthmus, what would you do? Pellerat waited cautiously, as though feeling there must be a terribly sophisticated answer expected of him. Finally giving up, he said, I suppose I'd ask somebody. Exactly. What else is there to do? Now, are you ready? You mean now? Pellerat scrambled to his feet, his pleasantly unemotional face coming as near as it might to a look of concern. What am I supposed to do? Sit? Stand? What? Time and space, Pellerat. You don't do anything. Just come with me to my room so I can use the computer. Then sit or stand or turn cartwheels, whatever will make you most comfortable. My suggestion is that you sit before the view screen and watch it. It's sure to be interesting. Come. They stepped along the short corridor to Trevise's room, and he seated himself at the computer. Would you like to do this, Janoff? He asked suddenly. I'll give you the figures, and all you do is think them. The computer will do the rest. Pellerette said, No, thank you. The computer doesn't work well with me somehow. I know you say I just need practice, but I don't believe that. There's something about your mind, Golan. Don't be foolish. No, no, that computer just seems to fit you. You and it seem to be a single organism when you're hooked up. When I'm hooked up, there are two objects involved. Janoff, Pellerette, and a computer. It's just not the same. Ridiculous, said Trevise. 
But he was vaguely pleased at the thought and stroked the handrest of the computer with loving fingertips. So I'd rather watch, said Pellerat. I mean, I'd rather it didn't happen at all, but as long as it will, I'd rather watch. He fixed his eyes anxiously on the viewscreen and on the foggy galaxy with the thin powdering of dim stars in the foreground. Let me know when it's about to happen. Slowly he backed against the wall and braced himself. Trevise smiled. He placed his hands on the rests and felt the mental union. It came more easily day by day, and more intimately, too. And however he might scoff at what Pellerat said, he actually felt it. It seemed to him he scarcely needed to think of the coordinates in any conscious way. It almost seemed the computer knew what he wanted without the conscious process of telling. It lifted the information out of his brain for itself. But Trevise told it, and then asked for a two-minute interval before the jump. All right, Janoff, we have two minutes. 120? 115? 110. Just watch the view screen. Pellaret did, with a slight tightness about the corners of his mouth and with a holding of his breath. Trevise said softly, Fifteen. Ten. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Zero. With no perceptible motion, no perceptible sensation, the view on the screen changed. There was a distinct thickening of the starfield, and the galaxy vanished. Pellaret started and said, Was that it? Was what it? You flinched, but that was your fault. You felt nothing, admit it. Uh, I admit it. Then that's it. Way back when hyperspatial travel was relatively new, according to the books anyway, there would be a queer internal sensation, and some people felt dizziness or nausea. It was perhaps psychogenic, perhaps not. In any case, with more and more experience with hyperspatiality and with better equipment, that decreased. With a computer like the one on board this vessel, any effect is well below the threshold of sensation. At least I find it so. And I do too, I must admit. Where are we, Golan? Just a step forward, in the Kalganian region. There's a long way to go yet, and before we make another move, we'll have to check the accuracy of the jump. What bothers me is, where's the galaxy? All around us, Jenoff. We're well inside it now. If we focus the view screen properly, we can see the more distant parts of it as a luminous band across the sky. The Milky Way, Pellerat cried out joyfully. Almost every world describes it in their sky, but it's something we don't see on Terminus. Show it to me, old fellow. The view screen tilted, giving the effect of a swimming of the starfield across it, and then there was a thick, pearly luminosity nearly filling the field. The screen followed it around as it thinned, then swelled again. Trevise said it's thicker in the direction of the center of the galaxy, not as thick or as bright as it might be, however, because of the dark clouds and the spiral arms. You see something like this from most inhabited worlds. And from Earth, too. There's no distinction. That would not be an identifying characteristic. Of course not. But you know... Oh, you haven't studied the history of science, have you? Not really, though I've picked up some of it naturally. Still, if you have questions to ask, don't expect me to be an expert. It's just that making this jump has put me in mind of something that has always puzzled me. It's possible to work out a description of the universe in which hyperspatial travel is impossible, and in which the speed of light traveling through a vacuum is the absolute maximum where speed is concerned. Certainly. Under those conditions, the geometry of the universe is such that it's impossible to make the trip we have just undertaken in less time than a ray of light would make it. And if we did it at the speed of light, our experience of duration would not match that of the universe generally. If this spot is, say, 40 parsecs from Terminus, then if we had gotten here at the speed of light, we would have felt no time lapse. But on Terminus, and in the entire galaxy, about 130 years would have passed. Now, we have made a trip, not at the speed of light, but at thousands of times the speed of light, actually, and there has been no time advance anywhere. At least I hope not. Tavis said, Don't expect me to give you the mathematics of the Olangian hyperspatial theory to you. All I can say is that if you had traveled at the speed of light within normal space, time would indeed have advanced at the rate of 3.26 years per parsec, as you described. The so-called relativistic universe, which humanity has understood as far back as we can probe into prehistory, though that's not your department, I think, remains, and its laws have not been repealed. In our hyperspatial jumps, however, we do something outside the conditions under which relativity operates, and the rules are different. Hyperspatially, the galaxy is a tiny object, ideally a non-dimensional dot, and there are no relativistic effects at all. In fact, in the mathematical formulations of cosmology, there are two symbols for the galaxy. G sub R for the relativistic galaxy, where the speed of light is a maximum, and G sub H for the hyperspatial galaxy, where speed does not really have a meaning. 
Hyperspatially, the value of all speed is zero, and we do not move. With reference to space itself, speed is infinite. I can't explain things a bit more than that. Oh, except that one of the beautiful catches in theoretical physics is to place a symbol or a value that has a meaning in G sub R into an equation dealing with G sub H, or vice versa, and leave it there for a student to deal with. The chances are enormous that the student falls into the trap and generally remains there, sweating and panting with nothing seeming to work, till some kindly elder helps him out. I was neatly caught that way once. Pellerat considered that gravely for a while, then said in a perplexed sort of way, But which is the true galaxy? Either, depending on what you're doing. If you're back on Terminus, you can use a car to cover distance on land and a ship to cover distance across the sea. Conditions are different in every way, so which is the true Terminus, the land or the sea? Pellerat nodded. Analogies are always risky, he said. But I'd rather accept that one than risk my sanity by thinking about hyperspace any further. I'll concentrate on what we're doing now. Look upon what we just did, said Trevise, as our first stop toward Earth. And, he thought to himself, toward what else, I wonder. 32. Well, said Trevise, I've wasted a day. Oh, Pellerat looked up from his careful indexing. In what way? Trevise spread his arms. I didn't trust the computer. I didn't dare to, so I checked our present position with the position we had aimed at in the jump. The difference was not measurable. There was no detectable error. That's good, isn't it? It's more than good. It's unbelievable. I've never heard of such a thing. I've gone through jumps, and I've directed them in all kinds of ways and with all kinds of devices. In school, I had to work one out with a hand computer, and then I sent off a hyper-relay to check results. Naturally, I couldn't send a real ship, since, aside from the expense, I could easily have placed it in the middle of a star at the other end. I never did anything that bad, of course, Trevise went on, but there would always be a sizable error. There's always some error, even with experts. There's got to be, since there are so many variables. Put it this way. The geometry of space is too complicated to handle, and hyperspace compounds all those complications with a complexity of its own that we can't even pretend to understand. That's why we have to go by steps, instead of making one big jump from here to Seychelles. The errors would grow worse with distance. Pellaret said, But you said this computer didn't make an error. It said it didn't make an error. I directed it to check our actual position with our pre-calculated position, what is against what was asked for. It said that the two were identical within its limits of measurement, and I thought, what if it's lying? Until that moment, Pellerat had held his printer in his hand. He now put it down and looked shaken. Are you joking? A computer can't lie, unless you mean you thought it might be out of order. No, that's not what I thought. Space, I thought it was lying. This computer is so advanced, I can't think of it as anything but human, superhuman maybe, human enough to have pride, and to lie perhaps. I gave it directions to work out a course through hyperspace to a position near Seychelles Planet, the capital of the Seychelles Union. It did, and charted a course in 29 steps, which is arrogance of the worst sort. Why arrogance? The error in the first jump makes the second jump that much less certain, and the added error then makes the third jump pretty wobbly and untrustworthy and so on. How do you calculate 29 steps all at once? The 29th could end up anywhere in the galaxy, anywhere at all. So I directed it to make the first step only, then we could check that before proceeding. The cautious approach, said Pellerat warmly. I approve. Yes, but having made the first step, might the computer not feel wounded at my having mistrusted it? Would it then be forced to salve its pride by telling me there was no error at all when I asked it? Would it find it impossible to admit a mistake, to own up to imperfection? If that were so, we might as well not have a computer. Pellerat's long and gentle face saddened. What can we do in that case, Golan? We can do what I did, waste a day. I checked the position of several of the surrounding stars by the most primitive possible methods, telescopic observation, photography, and manual measurement. I compared each actual position with the position expected if there had been no error. The work of it took me all day and wore me down to nothing. Yes, but what happened? I found two whopping errors and checked them over and found them in my calculations. I had made the mistakes myself. I corrected the calculations, then ran them through the computer from scratch, just to see if it would come up with the same answers independently. Except that it worked them out to several more decimal places, it turned out that my figures were right, and they showed that the computer had made no errors. The computer may be an arrogant son of the mule, but it's got something to be arrogant about. Pellerat exhaled a long breath. Well, that's good. Yes, indeed. 
So I'm going to let it take the other 28 steps. All at once? But not all at once. Don't worry. I haven't become a daredevil just yet. It will do them one after the other, but after each step it will check the surroundings, and if that is where it's supposed to be within tolerable limits, it can take the next one. Any time it finds the error too great, and believe me, I didn't set the limits generously at all, it will have to stop and recalculate the remaining steps. When are you going to do this? When? Oh, well, right now. Look, you're working on indexing your library. Oh, but this is the chance to do it, Colin. I've been meaning to do it for years, but something always seemed to get in the way. I have no objections. You go on and do it, and don't worry. Concentrate on the indexing. I'll take care of everything else. Pellerat shook his head. Don't be foolish. I can't relax till this is over. I'm scared stiff. I shouldn't have told you then, but I had to tell someone, and you're the only one here. Let me explain frankly. There's always the chance that we'll come to rest in a perfect position in interstellar space and that that will happen to be the precise position which a speeding meteoroid is occupying or a mini black hole and the ship is wrecked and we're dead. Such things could, in theory, happen. The chances are very small, however. After all, you could be at home, Genoff, in your study and working on your films or in your bed sleeping and a meteoroid could be streaking toward you through Terminus's atmosphere and hit you right in the head and you'd be dead. But the chances are small. In fact, the chance of intersecting the path of something fatal but too small for the computer to know about in the course of a hyperspatial jump is far, far smaller than that of being hit by a meteor in your own home. I've never heard of a ship being lost that way in all the history of hyperspatial travel. Any other type of risk, like ending in the middle of a star, is even smaller. Pellaret said, Then why do you tell me all this, Golan? Trevise paused, then bent his head in thought, and finally said, I don't know. Yes, I do. What I suppose it is, is that however small the chance of catastrophe might be, if enough people take enough chances, the catastrophe must happen eventually. No matter how sure I am that nothing will go wrong, there's a small, nagging voice inside me that says, maybe it'll happen this time. And it makes me feel guilty. I guess that's it. Genoff, if something goes wrong, forgive me. But Golan, my dear chap, if something goes wrong, we will both be dead instantly. I will not be able to forgive, nor you to receive forgiveness. I understand that, so forgive me now, will you? Pellaret smiled. I don't know why, but this cheers me up. There's something pleasantly humorous about it. Of course, Golan, I'll forgive you. There are plenty of myths about some form of afterlife in world literature, and if there should happen to be such a place, about the same chance as landing in a mini black hole, I suppose, or less, and we both turn up in the same one then I will bear witness that you did your honest best and that my death should not be laid at your door. Thank you. Now I'm relieved. I'm willing to take my chance. But I did not enjoy the thought of you taking my chance as well. Pellaret wrung the other's hand. You know, Golan, I've only known you less than a week, and I suppose I shouldn't make hasty judgments in these matters, but I think you're an excellent chap. And now, let's do it and get it over with. Absolutely. All I have to do is touch that little contact, the computer has its instructions and is just waiting for me to say, Start. Would you like to? Never. It's all yours. It's your computer. Very well. And it's my responsibility. I'm still trying to duck it, you see. Keep your eye on the screen. With a remarkably steady hand, and with his smile looking utterly genuine, Trevise made contact. There was a momentary pause, and then the star field changed. And again. And again. The stars spread steadily thicker and brighter over the viewscreen. Pellaret was counting under his breath. At fifteen, there was a halt, as though some piece of apparatus had jammed. Pellaret whispered, clearly afraid that any noise might jar the mechanism fatally. What's wrong? What's happened? Tavis shrugged. I imagine it's recalculating. Some object in space is adding a perceptible bump to the general shape of the overall gravitational field. Some object not taken into account. Some uncharted dwarf star or rogue planet. Dangerous? Since we're still alive, it's almost certainly not dangerous. A planet could be a hundred million kilometers away and still introduce a large enough gravitational modification to require recalculation. A dwarf star could be ten billion kilometers away and... The screen shifted again, and Trevise fell silent. It shifted again... And again. Finally, when Pellerat said, 28, there was no further motion. Trevise consulted the computer. We're here, he said. I counted the first jump as one, and in this series I started with two. That's 28 jumps altogether. You said 29. 
The recalculation to jump 15 probably saved us one jump. I can check with the computer if you wish, but there's really no need. We're in the vicinity of Seychelles Planet. The computer says so, and I don't doubt it. If I were to orient the screen properly, we'd see a nice, bright sun. But there's no point in placing a needless strain on its screening capacity. Seychelles Planet is the fourth one out, and it's about 3.2 million kilometers away from our present position, which is about as close as we want to be at a jump conclusion. We can get there in three days. Two if we hurry. Trevise drew a deep breath and tried to let the tensions drain. Do you realize what this means, Janoff? he said. Every ship I've ever been in or heard of would have made those jumps with at least a day in between for painstaking calculation and rechecking, even with a computer. The trip would have taken nearly a month, or perhaps two or three weeks if they were willing to be reckless about it. We did it in half an hour. When every ship is equipped with a computer like this one, Pellaret said, I wonder why the mayor let us have a ship this advanced. It must be incredibly expensive. It's experimental, said Trevise dryly. Maybe the good woman was perfectly willing to have us try it out and see what deficiencies might develop. Are you serious? Don't get nervous. After all, there's nothing to worry about. We haven't found any deficiencies. I wouldn't put it past her, though. Such a thing would put no great strain on her sense of humanity. Besides, she hasn't trusted us with offensive weapons, and that cuts the expense considerably. Pellaret said thoughtfully, It's the computer I'm thinking about. It seems to be adjusted so well for you, and it can't be adjusted that well for everyone. It just barely works with me. So much the better for us that it works so well with one of us. Yes, but is that merely chance? What else, Jenna? Surely the mayor knows you pretty well. I think she does, the old battlecraft. Might she not have had a computer designed particularly for you? Why? I just wonder if we're not going where the computer wants to take us. Trevi stared. You mean that while I'm connected to the computer, it is the computer and not me who is in real charge? I just wonder. That is ridiculous. Paranoid. Come on, Janoff. Trevise turned back to the computer to focus Seychelles Planet on the screen and to plot a normal space course to it. Ridiculous. But why had Pellaret put the notion into his head? Chapter 10. Table. 33. Two days had passed, and Jendabal found himself not so much heavy-hearted as enraged. There was no reason why there could not have been an immediate hearing. Had he been unprepared, had he needed time, they would have forced an immediate hearing on him, he was sure. But since there was nothing more facing the Second Foundation than the greatest crisis since the mule, they wasted time, and to no purpose but to irritate him. They did irritate him, and by Selden that would make his counterstroke the heavier. He was determined on that. He looked about him. The anteroom was empty. It had been like that for two days now. He was a marked man, a speaker whom all knew would, by means of an action unprecedented in the five-century history of the Second Foundation, soon lose his position. He would be demoted to the ranks, demoted to the position of a Second Foundationer, plain and simple. It was one thing, however, and a very honored thing, to be a Second Foundationer of the ranks, particularly if one held a respectable title, as Gendabal might even after the impeachment. It would be quite another thing to have once been a speaker and to have been demoted. It won't happen, though, thought Gendabal savagely, even though for two days he had been avoided. Only Sordanovi treated him as before, but she was too naive to understand the situation. To her, Gendabal was still master. It irritated Gendabal that he found a certain comfort in this. He felt ashamed when he began to notice that his spirits rose when he noticed her gazing at him worshipfully. Was he becoming grateful for gifts that small? A clerk emerged from the chamber to tell him that the table was ready for him, and Gendabal stalked in. The clerk was one Gendabal knew well. He was one who knew to the tiniest fraction the precise gradation of civility that each speaker deserved. At the moment, that, accorded Gendabal, was appallingly low. Even the clerk thought him as good as convicted. They were all sitting about the table gravely, wearing the black robes of judgment. First Speaker Shandus looked a bit uncomfortable, but he did not allow his face to crease into the smallest touch of friendliness. Delarmy, one of the three speakers who were women, did not even look at him. The first speaker said, Speaker Storge Enderball, you have been impeached for behaving in a manner unbecoming a speaker. You have, before us all, accused the table, vaguely and without evidence, of treason and attempted murder. 
You have implied that all second foundationers, including the speakers and the first speaker, require a thorough mental analysis to ascertain who among them are no longer to be trusted. Such behavior breaks the bonds of community, without which the second foundation cannot control an intricate and potentially hostile galaxy, and without which they cannot build with surety a viable second empire. Since we have all witnessed those offenses, we will forego the presentation of a formal case for the prosecution. We will therefore move directly to the next stage. Speaker Storch Enderball, do you have a defense? Now Delarmy, still not looking at him, allowed herself a small, cat-like smile. Jendabal said, If truth be considered defense, I have one. There are grounds for suspecting a breach of security. That breach may involve the mental control of one or more second foundationers, not excluding members here present, and this has created a deadly crisis for the second foundation. If indeed you hasten this trial because you cannot waste time, you may all perhaps dimly recognize the seriousness of the crisis. But in that case... Why have you wasted two days after I had formally requested an immediate trial? I submit that it is this deadly crisis that has forced me to say what I have said. I would have behaved in a manner unbecoming a speaker had I not done so. He but repeats the offense, first speaker, said Delarmy softly. Jendabal's seat was further removed from the table than that of the others, a clear demotion already. He pushed it farther back, as though he cared nothing for that, and rose. He said... Will you convict me now out of hand in defiance of law, or may I present my defense in detail? The first speaker said, This is not a lawless assemblage, speaker. Without much in the way of precedent to guide us, we will lean in your direction, recognizing that if our two human abilities should cause us to deviate from absolute justice, it is better to allow the guilty to go free than to convict the innocent. Therefore, although the case before us is so grave that we may not lightly allow the guilty to go free... We will permit you to present your case in such manner as you wish, and for as long as you require, until it is decided by unanimous vote, including my own, and he raised his voice at that phrase, that enough has been heard. Jendabal said, Let me begin, then, by saying that Golan Treviz, the first foundationer who has been driven from Terminus, and whom the first speaker and I believe to be the knife edge of the gathering crisis, has moved off in an unexpected direction. Point of information, said Delarmy softly, how does the speaker, the intonation clearly indicated that the word was not capitalized, know this? I was informed of this by the first speaker, said Jendabal, but I confirm it of my own knowledge. Under the circumstances, however, considering my suspicions concerning the level of the security of the chamber, I must be allowed to keep my sources of information secret. The first speaker said, I will suspend judgment on that. Let us proceed without that item of information. But if, in the judgment at the table, the information must be obtained, Speaker Jendabal will have to yield it. Delarmy said, If the Speaker does not yield the information now, it is only fair to say that I assume he has an agent serving him, an agent who is privately employed by him and who is not responsible to the table generally. We cannot be sure that such an agent is obeying the rules of behavior governing Second Foundation personnel. The First Speaker said with some displeasure, I see all the implications, Speaker Delarmy. There is no need to spell them out for me. I merely mention it for the record, First Speaker, since this aggravates the offense, and it is not an item mentioned in the Bill of Impeachment, which I would like to say has not been read in full, and to which I move this item be added. The clerk is directed to add the item, said the First Speaker, and the precise wording will be adjusted at the appropriate time. Speaker Genderball, he at least capitalized, your defense is indeed a step backward. Continue. Jendabal said, Not only has this Trevise moved in an unexpected direction, but at an unprecedented speed. My information, which the first speaker does not yet have, is that he has traveled nearly 10,000 parsecs in well under an hour. In a single jump? said one of the speakers incredulously. In over two dozen jumps, one after the other, with virtually no time intervening, said Jendabal, something that is even more difficult to imagine than a single jump. Even if he is now located, it will take time to follow him, and if he detects us and really means to flee us, we will not be able to overtake him. And you spend your time in games of impeachment and allow two days to pass so that you might savor them the more. The first speaker managed to mask his anguish. Please tell us, Speaker Jendabal, what you think the significance of this might be. It is an indication, First Speaker, of the technological advances that are being made by the First Foundation, who are far more powerful now than they were in the time of Prem Palver. We could not stand up against them if they found us and were free to act. Speaker Delarmy rose to her feet, 
she said. First speaker, our time is being wasted with irrelevancies. We are not children to be frightened with tales by Grandmother Space Warp. It does not matter how impressive the machinery of the First Foundation is when in any crisis their minds will be in our control. What do you have to say to that, Speaker Genderball? asked the first speaker. Merely that we will come to the matter of minds in due course. For the moment, I merely wish to stress the superior and increasing technological might of the First Foundation. The first speaker said, Pass on to the next point, Speaker Genderball. Your first point, I must tell you, does not impress me as very pertinent to the matter contained in the Bill of Impeachment. There was a clear gesture of agreement from the table generally. Genderball said, I pass on. Trevise has a companion in his present journey. He paused momentarily to consider pronunciation. One Janoff Pellerat, a rather ineffectual scholar who has devoted his life to tracking down myths and legends concerning Earth. You know all this about him? Your hidden source, I presume, said Delarmy, who had settled into a role of prosecutor with a clear feeling of comfort. Yes, I know all this about him, said Jandabal stolidly. A few months ago, the mayor of Terminus, an energetic and capable woman, grew interested in this scholar for no clear reason, and so I grew interested, too, as a matter of course. Nor have I kept this to myself. All the information I have gained has been made available to the first speaker. I bear witness to that, said the first speaker in a low voice. An elderly speaker said, What is this earth? Is it the world of origin we keep coming across in fables, the one they made a fuss about in old imperial times? Jendabal nodded. In the tales of Grandmother's space warp, as Speaker Delarmy would say, I suspect it was Pellerad's dream to come to Trantor to consult the Galactic Library in order to find information concerning Earth that he could not obtain in the interstellar library service available on Terminus. When he left Terminus with Trevise, he must have been under the impression that that dream was to be fulfilled. Certainly we were expecting the two, and counted on having the opportunity to examine them to our own profit. As it turns out, and as you all know by now, they are not coming. They have turned off to some destination that is not yet clear, and for some reason that is not yet known. Delarmy's round face looked positively cherubic as she said, And why is this disturbing? We are no worse off for their absence, surely. Indeed, since they dismiss us so easily, we can deduce that the First Foundation does not know the true nature of Trantor, and we can applaud the handiwork of Preem Palver. Jendabal said, If we thought no further, we might indeed come to such a comforting solution. Could it be, though, that the turnoff was not the result of any failure to see the importance of Trantor? Could it be that the turnoff resulted from anxiety lest Trantor, by examining these two men, see the importance of Earth? There was a stir about the table. Anyone, said Delarmy coldly, can invent formidable-sounding propositions and couch them in balanced sentences. But do they make sense when you do invent them? Why should anyone care what we of the Second Foundation think of Earth, whether it is the true planet of origin or whether it is a myth or whether there is no one place of origin to begin with is surely something that should interest only historians, anthropologists, and folktale collectors such as this Pellerat of yours. Why us? Why, indeed, said Gendabal. How is it, then, that there are no references to Earth in the library? For the first time, something in the atmosphere that was other than hostility made itself felt about the table. Delarmy said, Aren't there? Gendabal said quite calmly. When word first reached me that Trevise and Pellerat might be coming here in search of information concerning Earth, I, as a matter of course, had our library computer make a listing of documents containing such information. I was mildly interested when it turned up nothing. Not minor quantities, not very little. Nothing. But then you insisted I wait for two days before this hearing could take place, and at the same time my curiosity was further piqued by the news that the First Foundationers were not coming here after all. I had to amuse myself somehow. While the rest of you therefore were, as the saying goes, sipping wine while the house was falling, I went through some history books in my own possession. I came across passages that specifically mention some of the investigations on the origin question in late imperial times. Particular documents, both printed and filmed, were referred to and quoted from. I returned to the library and made a personal check for those documents. I assure you, there was nothing. Delarmy said, Even if this is so, it need not be surprising. If Earth is indeed a myth, then I would find it in mythological references. If it were a story of Grandmother Space Warp, I would find it in the collected tales of Grandmother Space Warp. If it were a figment of the diseased mind, I would find it under psychopathology. The fact is that something about Earth exists, or you would not all have heard of it, and indeed immediately recognized it as the name of the putative planet of origin of the human species. 
Why, then, is there no reference to it in the library anywhere? Delarmy was silent for a moment, and another speaker interposed. He was Leonis Cheng, a rather small man with an encyclopedic knowledge of the minutiae of the Selgin plan and a rather myopic attitude toward the actual galaxy. His eyes tended to blink rapidly when he spoke. He said, It is well known that the Empire in its final days attempted to create an imperial mystique by soft-peddling all interest in pre-imperial times. Chendabal nodded. Soft-peddled is the precise term, Speaker Cheng. That is not equivalent to destroying evidence. As you should know better than anyone, another characteristic of imperial decay was a sudden interest in earlier and presumably better times. I have just referred to the interest in the origin question in Harry Selden's time. Cheng interrupted with a formidable clearing of the throat. I know this very well, young man, and know far more of these social problems of imperial decay than you seem to think I do. The process of imperialization overtook these dilettantish games concerning Earth. Under Cleon II, during the Empire's last resurgent, two centuries after Selden, imperialization reached its peak, and all speculation on the question of Earth came to an end. There was even a directive in Cleon's time concerning this, referring to the interest in such things as, and I think I quote it correctly, stale and unproductive speculation that tends to undermine the people's love of the imperial throne. Jendabal smiled. Then it was in the time of Cleon II, Speaker Chang, that you would place the destruction of all reference to Earth? I draw no conclusions. I have simply stated what I have stated. It is shrewd of you to draw no conclusions. By Cleon's time, the Empire may have been resurgent, but the university, and library at least, were in our hands, or at any rate in those of our predecessors, it would have been impossible for any material to be removed from the library without the speakers of the Second Foundation knowing it. In fact, it would have been the speakers to whom the task would have had to be entrusted, though the dying empire would not have known that. Jendabal paused, but Cheng, saying nothing, looked over the other's head. Jendabal said, It follows that the library could not have been emptied of material on earth during Selden's time, since the origin question was then an active preoccupation. It could not have been emptied afterward because the second foundation was in charge. Yet the library is empty of it now. How can this be? Delarmy broke in impatiently. You may stop weaving the dilemma, Jendabal. We see it. What is it that you suggest as a solution? That you have removed the documents yourself? As usual, Delarmy, you penetrate to the heart. And Jendabal bent his head to her in sardonic respect, at which she allowed herself a slight lifting of the lip. One solution is that the cleansing was done by a speaker of the Second Foundation, someone who would know how to use curators without leaving a memory behind, and computers without leaving a record behind. First Speaker Shandis turned red. Ridiculous, Speaker Jandibal. I cannot imagine a speaker doing this. What would the motivation be? Even if, for some reason, the material on earth were removed, why keep it from the rest of the table? Why risk a complete destruction of one's career by tampering with the library when the chances of its being discovered are so great? Besides, I don't think that even the most skillful speaker could perform the task without leaving a trace. Then it must be, First Speaker, that you disagree with Speaker Delarmy in her suggestion that I did it. I certainly do, said the First Speaker. Sometimes I doubt your judgment, but I have yet to consider you downright insane. Then it must never have happened, First Speaker. The material on earth must still be in the library, for we now seem to have eliminated all the possible ways in which it could have been removed. And yet... The material is not there. Delarmy said with an affectation of weariness, Well, well, let us finish. Again, what is it you suggest as a solution? I am sure you think you have one. If you are sure, Speaker, we may all be sure as well. My suggestion is that the library was cleansed by someone of the Second Foundation who was under the control of a subtle force from outside the Second Foundation. The cleansing went unnoticed because that same force saw to it that it was not noticed. Delarmy laughed. Until you found out. You, the uncontrolled and uncontrollable. If this mysterious force existed, how did you find out about the absence of material from the library? Why weren't you controlled? Jandabal said gravely, It's not a laughing matter, Speaker. They may feel as we feel, that all tempering should be held to a minimum. When my life was in danger a few days ago, I was more concerned with refraining from fiddling with a Hamish mind than with protecting myself. So it might be with these others... As soon as they felt it was safe, they ceased tampering. That is the danger, the deadly danger. The fact that I could find out what has happened may mean they no longer care that I do. The fact that they no longer care may mean that they feel they have already won, and we continue to play our games here. But what aim do they have in all this? What conceivable aim? 
demanded Delarmy, shuffling her feet and biting her lips. She felt her power fading as the table grew more interested, concerned. Jindabal said, Consider. The first foundation, with its enormous arsenal of physical power, is searching for Earth. They pretend to send out two exiles, hoping we will think that is all they are. But would they equip them with ships of unbelievable power, ships that can move 10,000 parsecs in less than an hour, if that's all that they were? As for the second foundation, we have not been searching for Earth, and clearly steps have been taken without our knowledge to keep any information of Earth away from us. The first foundation is now so close to finding Earth, and we are so far from doing so that... Jendabal paused, and Delarmy said, That what? Finish your childish tale. Do you know anything, or don't you? I don't know everything, Speaker. I have not penetrated the total depth of the web that is encircling us, but I know the web is there. I don't know what the significance of finding Earth might be, but I am certain the second foundation is in enormous danger, and with it, the Selden plan and the future of all humanity. Delarmy rose to her feet. She was not smiling, and she spoke in a tense but tightly controlled voice. Trash! First speaker, put an end to this. What is at issue is the accused behavior. What he tells us is not only childish but irrelevant. He cannot extenuate his behavior by building a cobwebbery of theories that make sense only in his own mind. I call for a vote on the matter now, a unanimous vote for conviction. Wait, said Jandabal sharply. I have been told I would have an opportunity to defend myself, and there remains one more item, one more. Let me present that, and you may proceed to a vote with no further objection from me. The first speaker rubbed his eyes wearily. You may continue, Speaker Jandabal. Let me point out to the table that the conviction of an impeached speaker is so weighty and indeed unprecedented an action that we dare not give the appearance of not allowing a full defense. Remember, too, that even if the verdict satisfies us, it may not satisfy those who come after us, and I cannot believe that a second foundation or of any level, let alone the speakers of the table, would not have a full appreciation of the importance of historical perspective. Let us so act that we can be certain of the approval of the speakers who will follow us in the coming centuries. Delarmy said bitterly, We run the risk, First Speaker, of having posterity laugh at us for belaboring the obvious. To continue the defense is your decision. Jendabal drew a deep breath. In line with your decision, then, First Speaker, I wish to call a witness. A young woman I met three days ago, and without whom I might not have reached the table meeting at all, instead of merely being late. Is the woman you speak of known to the table? asked the first speaker. No, first speaker. She is a native to this planet. Delarmy's eyes opened wide. A Hamish woman? Indeed, just so. Delarmy said, What have we to do with one of those? Nothing they say can be of any importance. They don't exist. Jendabal's lips drew back tightly over his teeth in something that could not possibly have been mistaken for a smile. He said sharply, Physically, all the Hamish exist. They are human beings and play their part in Selden's plan. In their indirect protection of the Second Foundation, they play a crucial part. I wish to dissociate myself from Speaker Delarmy's inhumanity and hope that her remark will be retained in the record and be considered hereafter as evidence for her possible unfitness for the position of Speaker. Will the rest of the table agree with the Speaker's incredible remark and deprive me of my witness? The first Speaker said, Call your witness, Speaker. Jendabal's lips relaxed into the normal, expressionless features of a Speaker under pressure, his mind was guarded and fenced in, but behind this protective barrier he felt that the danger point had passed, and that he had won. 34. Suranovi looked strained. Her eyes were wide, and her lower lip was faintly trembling. Her hands were slowly clenching and unclenching, and her chest was heaving slightly. Her hair had been pulled back and braided into a bun. Her sun-darkened face twitched now and then. Her hands fumbled at the pleats of her long skirt, she looked hastily around the table from speaker to speaker, her wide eyes filled with awe. They glanced back at her with varying degrees of contempt and discomfort. The Larmy kept her eyes well above the top of Novi's head, oblivious to her presence. Carefully, Jendabal touched the skin of her mind, soothing and relaxing it. He might have done the same by patting her hand or stroking her cheek, but here, under these circumstances, that was impossible, of course. He said, For speaker, I am numbing this woman's conscious awareness so that her testimony will not be distorted by fear. Will you please observe? Will the rest of you, if you wish, join me, and observe that I will in no way modify her mind? Novi had started back in terror at Jendabal's voice, and Jendabal was not surprised at that. He realized that she had never heard second foundationers of high rank speak among themselves. She had never experienced that odd, swift combination of sound, tone, expression, and thought. 
The terror, however, faded as quickly as it came, as he gentled her mind. A look of placidity crossed her face. There is a chair behind you, Novi, Gentleball said. Please sit down. Novi curtsied in a small and clumsy manner and sat down, holding herself stiffly. She talked quite clearly, but Gendabal made her repeat when her Hamish accent became too thick, and because he kept his own speech formal in deference to the table, he occasionally had to repeat his own questions to her. The tale of the fight between himself and Rufferant was described quietly and well. Gendabal said, Did you see all this yourself, Novi? Nay, master, or I would have sooner stopped it. Rufferant be good fellow, but not quick in head. But you described it all. How is that possible if you did not see it all? Rufi Rant be telling me thereof, unquestioning. He be ashamed. Ashamed? Have you ever known him to behave in this manner in earlier times? Rufi Rant? Nay, master. He be gentle, though he be large. He be no fighter, and he be afeard of scowlers. He say often, they are mighty and possessive of power. Why didn't he feel this way when he met me? It be strange. It be not understood. She shook her head. He be not his ain self. I said to him, Thou blubberhead, be at your place to a sound scowler. And he said, I know not how it happened. It be like I am on one side standing and watching, not I. Speaker Cheng interrupted. Fair Speaker, of what value is it to have this woman report what a man has told her? Is not the man available for questioning? Gendabal said, He is. If on completion of this woman's testimony the table wishes to hear more evidence, I will be ready to call Carol Rufirant, my recent antagonist, to the stand. If not, the table can move directly to judgment when I am done with this witness. Very well, said the first speaker. Proceed with your witness. Gendabal said, And you, Novi, was it like you to interfere in a fight in this manner? Novi did not say anything for a moment. A small frown appeared between her thick eyebrows and then disappeared. She said, I know not. I wish no harm to scowlers. I be driven, and without thought I enmeddled myself. A pause, then... I be do it over if the need arise. Gendabal said, Novi, you will sleep now. You will think of nothing. You will rest, and you will not even dream. Novi mumbled for a moment. Her eyes closed, and her head fell back against the headrest of her chair. Gendabal waited a moment, then said, First speaker, with respect, follow me into this woman's mind. You will find it remarkably simple and symmetrical, which is fortunate for what you will see might not have been visible otherwise. Here. Here. Do you observe? If the rest of you will enter, it will be easier if it is done one at a time. There was a rising buzz about the table. Gendabal said, Is there any doubt among you? Delarmy said, I doubt it for... She paused on the brink of what was, even for her, unsayable. Gendabal said it for her. You think I deliberately tampered with his mind in order to present false evidence? You think, therefore, that I am capable of bringing about so delicate an adjustment, one mental fiber clearly out of shape, with nothing about it or its surroundings that is in the least disturbed? If I could do that, what need would I have to deal with any of you in this manner? Why subject myself to the indignity of a trial? Why labor to convince you? If I could do what is visible in this woman's mind, you would all be helpless before me, unless you were well prepared." The blunt fact is that none of you could manipulate a mind as this woman's has been manipulated. Neither can I. Yet it has been done. He paused, looking at all the speakers in turn, then fixing his gaze on Delarmy. He spoke slowly. Now, if anything more is required, I will call in the Hamish farmer, Carol Rufirant, whom I have examined, and whose mind has also been tampered with in this manner. That will not be necessary said the first speaker, who was wearing an appalled expression. What we have seen is mind-shaking. In that case, said Gendabal, may I rouse this Hamish woman and dismiss her? I have arranged for there to be those outside who will see to her recovery. When Novi had left, directed by Gendabal's gentle hold on her elbow, he said, Let me quickly summarize. Minds can be, and have been, altered in ways that are beyond our power. In this way, the curators themselves could have been influenced to remove earth material from the library without our knowledge or their own. We see how it was arranged that I should be delayed in arriving at a meeting of the table. I was threatened. I was rescued. The result was that I was impeached. The result of this apparently natural concatenation of events is that I may be removed from a position of power, and the course of action which I champion and which threatens these people, whoever they are, may be negated. Delarmy leaned forward. She was clearly shaken. 
If this secret organization is so clever, how were you able to discover all this? Jandabal felt free to smile now. No credit to me, he said. I lay no claim to expertise superior to that of other speakers, certainly not to the first speaker. However, neither are these anti-mules, as the first speaker has rather engagingly called them, infinitely wise or infinitely immune to circumstance. Perhaps they chose this particular Hamish woman as their instrument precisely because she needed very little adjustment. She was, of her own character, sympathetic to what she calls scholars, and admired them intensely. But then, once this was over, her momentary contact with me strengthened her fantasy of becoming a scholar herself. She came to me the next day with that purpose in mind. Curious at this peculiar ambition of hers, I studied her mind, which I certainly would not otherwise have done, and, more by accident than anything else, stumbled upon the adjustment and noted its significance. Had another woman been chosen, one with a less natural pro-scholar bias, the anti-mules might have had to labor more at the adjustment, but the consequences might well not have followed, and I would have remained ignorant of all this. The anti-mules miscalculated, or could not sufficiently allow for the unforeseen. That they can stumble so is heartening. Delarmy said, The first speaker and you call this organization the anti-mules, I presume, because they seem to labor to keep the galaxy in the path of the Selden plan, rather than to disrupt it as the mule himself did. If the anti-mules do this, why are they dangerous? Why should they labor, if not for some purpose? We don't know what that purpose is. A cynic might say that they intend to step in at some future time and turn the current in another direction, one that may please them far more than it would please us. That is my own feeling, even though I do not major in cynicism. Is Speaker Delarmy prepared to maintain, out of the love and trust that we all know form so great a part of her character, that these are cosmic altruists doing our work for us without dream of reward? There was a gentle susurration of laughter about the table at this, and Jendabal knew that he had won. And Delarmy knew that she had lost, for there was a wash of rage that showed through her harsh mentalic control like a momentary ray of ruddy sunlight through a thick canopy of leaves. Jendabal said, When I first experienced the incident with a Hamish farmer, I leaped to the conclusion that another speaker was behind it. When I noted the adjustment of the Hamish woman's mind, I knew that I was right as to the plot, but wrong as to the plotter. I apologize for the misinterpretation, and I plead the circumstances as an extenuation. The first speaker said, I believe this may be construed as an apology. Delarmy interrupted. She was quite placid again. Her face was friendly, her voice downright saccharine. With total respect, first speaker, if I may interrupt, let us drop this matter of impeachment. At this moment, I would not vote for conviction, and I imagine no one will. I would even suggest the impeachment be stricken from the speaker's unblemished record. Speaker Jendabal has exonerated himself ably. I congratulate him on that, and for uncovering a crisis that the rest of us might well have allowed to smolder on indefinitely with incalculable results. I offer the speaker my wholehearted apologies for my earlier hostility. She virtually beamed at Jendabal, who felt a reluctant admiration for the manner in which she shifted direction instantly in order to cut her losses. He also felt that all this was but preliminary to an attack from a new direction. He was certain that what was coming would not be pleasant. 35. When she exerted herself to be charming, Speaker Delora Delarmy had a way of dominating the speaker's table. Her voice grew soft, her smile indulgent, her eyes sparkling, all of her sweet. No one cared to interrupt her, and everyone waited for the blow to fall. She said, Thanks to Speaker Jendabal, I think we all now understand what we must do. We do not see the anti-mules. We know nothing about them except for their fugitive touches on the minds of people right here in the stronghold of the Second Foundation itself. We do not know what the power center of the First Foundation is planning. We may face an alliance of the anti-mules and the First Foundation. We don't know. We do know that this Golan Trevise and his companion, whose name escapes me at the moment, are going we know not where, and that the First Speaker and Jandabal feel that Trevise holds the key to the outcome of this great crisis. What, then, are we to do? Clearly, we must find out everything we can about Trevise, where he is going, what he is thinking, what his purpose may be, or, indeed, whether he has any destination, any thought, any purpose, whether he might not, in fact, be a mere tool of a force greater than he. Jendabal said, He is under observation. Delarby pursed her lips in an indulgent smile. By whom? By one of our outworld agents? Are such agents to be expected to stand against those with the powers we have seen demonstrated here? Surely not. 
In the mule's time, and later on, too, the Second Foundation did not hesitate to send out, and even to sacrifice, volunteers from among the best we had, since nothing less would do. When it was necessary to restore the Salden plan, Bream Palver himself scoured the galaxy as a Trantorian trader in order to bring back that girl, Arkady. We cannot sit here and wait now, when the crisis may be greater than in either previous case. We cannot rely on minor functionaries, watchers, and messenger boys. Chendabal said, Surely you are not suggesting that the first speaker leave Trantor at this time. Delarmy said, Certainly not. We need him badly here. On the other hand, there is you, Speaker Chendabal. It is you who have correctly sensed and weighed the crisis. It is you who detected the subtle outside interference with the library and with Hamish Mines. It is you who have maintained your views against the united opposition of the table and won. No one here has seen as clearly as you have, and no one can be trusted as you can to continue to see clearly. It is you who must, in my opinion, go out to confront the enemy. May I have the sense of the table? There was no formal vote needed to reveal that sense. Each speaker felt the minds of the others, and it was clear to a suddenly appalled Gendabal that, at the moment of his victory in Delarmy's defeat, this formidable woman was managing to send him irrevocably into exile on a task that might occupy him for some indefinite period, while she remained behind to control the table, and therefore the second foundation, and therefore the galaxy, sending all alike, perhaps, to their doom. And if Gendabal and Exile should somehow manage to gather the information that would enable the Second Foundation to avert the gathering crisis, it would be Delarmy who would have the credit for having arranged it, and his success would but confirm her power. The quicker Gendabal would be, the more efficiently he succeeded, the more surely he would confirm her power. It was a beautiful maneuver, an unbelievable recovery. And so clearly was she dominating the table even now that she was virtually usurping the first speaker's role. Gendabal's thought to that effect was overtaken by the rage he sensed from the first speaker. He turned. The first speaker was making no effort to hide his anger, and it soon was clear that another internal crisis was building to replace the one that had been resolved. 36. Quindoshandis, the 25th first speaker, had no extraordinary illusions about himself. He knew he was not one of those few dynamic first speakers who had illuminated the five-century-long history of the Second Foundation, but then he didn't have to be. He controlled the table in a quiet period of galactic prosperity, and it was not a time for dynamism. It had seemed to be a time to play a holding game, and he had been the man for this role. His predecessor had chosen him for that reason. You are not an adventurer, you are a scholar, the 24th first speaker had said. You will preserve the plan, where an adventurer might ruin it. Preserve. Let that be the key word for your table. He had tried but it had meant a passive first speakership, and this had been on occasion interpreted as weakness. There had been recurrent rumors that he meant to resign, and there had been open intrigue to assure the succession in one direction or another. There was no doubt in Shandis's mind that Delarmy had been a leader in the fight. She was the strongest personality at the table, and even Gendabal, with all the fire and folly of youth, retreated before her, as he was doing right now. But by Selden, passive he might be, or even weak, but there was one prerogative of the first speaker that not one in the line had ever given up, and neither would he do so. He rose to speak, and at once there was a hush about the table. When the first speaker rose to speak, there could be no interruptions. Even Delarmy or Gendabal would not dare to interrupt. He said, Speakers, I agree that we face a dangerous crisis, and that we must take strong measures. It is I who should go out to meet the enemy. Speaker Delarmy, with the gentleness that characterizes her, excuses me from the task by stating that I am needed here. The truth, however, is that I am needed neither here nor there. I grow old. I grow weary. There has long been expectation I would someday resign, and perhaps I ought to. When this crisis is successfully surmounted, I shall resign. But, of course, it is the privilege of the first speaker to choose his successor. I am going to do so now. There is one speaker who has long dominated the proceedings of the table, one speaker who, by force of personality, has often supplied the leadership that I could not. You all know I am speaking of Speaker Delarmy. He paused and said, You alone, Speaker Gendabal, are registering this approval. May I ask why? He sat down so that Gendabal might have the right to answer. I do not disapprove, First Speaker, said Gendabal in a low voice. It is your prerogative to choose your successor. And so I will. When you return, having succeeded in initiating the process that will put an end to this crisis, it will be time for my resignation. My successor will then be directly in charge of conducting whatever policies may be required to carry on and complete that process. Do you have anything to say, Speaker Gendabal? 
Chandabal said quietly, When you make Speaker Delarmy your successor, First Speaker, I hope you will see fit to advise her to... The First Speaker interrupted him roughly. I have spoken of Speaker Delarmy, but I have not named her as my successor. Now, what do you have to say? My apologies, First Speaker. I should have said, assuming you make Speaker Delarmy your successor upon my return from this mission, would you see fit to advise her? Nor will I make her my successor in the future under any conditions. Now, what do you have to say? The first speaker was unable to make this announcement without a stab of satisfaction at the blow he was delivering to Delarmy. He could not have done it in a more humiliating fashion. Well, Speaker Gendeval, he said, what do you have to say? That I am confused. The first speaker rose again. He said, Speaker Delarmy has dominated and led, but that is not all that is needed for the post of first speaker. Speaker Gendeval has seen what we have not seen. He has faced the united hostility of the table and forced it to rethink matters and has dragged it into agreement with him. I have my suspicions as to the motivation of Speaker Delarmy in placing the responsibility of the pursuit of Golan Treviz on the shoulders of Speaker Gendeval, but that is where the burden belongs. I know he will succeed. I trust my intuition in this. And when he returns, Speaker Gendeval will become the 26th First Speaker. He sat down abruptly, and each speaker began to make clear his opinion in a bedlam of sound, tone, thought, and expression. The First Speaker paid no attention to the cacophony, but stared indifferently before him. Now that it was done, he realized, with some surprise, the great comfort there was in laying down the mantle of responsibility. He should have done it before this, but he couldn't have. It was not till now that he had found his obvious successor. And then, somehow, his mind caught that of Delarmy, and he looked up at her. By Selden. She was calm and smiling. Her desperate disappointment did not show. She had not given up. He wondered if he had played into her hands. What was there left for her to do? 37. Delora Delarmy would freely have shown her desperation and disappointment if that would have proven of any use whatever. It would have given her a great deal of satisfaction to strike out at that senile fool who controlled the table or at that juvenile idiot with whom fortune had conspired. But satisfaction wasn't what she wanted. She wanted something more. She wanted to be first speaker. And while there was a card left to play, she would play it. She smiled gently and managed to lift her hand as though she were about to speak, and then held the pose just long enough to ensure that when she did speak, all would be not merely normal, but radiantly quiet. She said, First Speaker, as Speaker Gendebal said earlier, I do not disapprove. It is your prerogative to choose your successor. If I speak now, it is in order that I may contribute, I hope, to the success of what has now become Speaker Gendebal's mission. May I explain my thoughts, First Speaker? Do so, said the First Speaker curtly. She was entirely too smooth, too pliant, it seemed to him. Delarmy bent her head gravely. She no longer smiled. She said, We have ships. They are not as technologically magnificent as those of the First Foundation, but they will carry Speaker Gendebal. He knows how to pilot one, I believe, as do we all. We have our representatives on every major planet in the galaxy, and he will be welcomed everywhere. Moreover, he can defend himself against even these anti-mules now that he is thoroughly aware of the danger. Even when we were unaware, I suspect they have preferred to work through the lower classes and even the Hamish farmers. We will, of course, thoroughly inspect the minds of all the Second Foundationers, including the speakers, but I am sure they have remained inviolate. The anti-mules did not dare interfere with us. Nevertheless, there is no reason why Speaker Gendebal should risk more than he must. He is not intending to engage in daring do, and it will be best if his mission is to some extent disguised if he takes them unaware. It will be useful if he goes in the role of a Hamish trader. Preem Palver, we all know, went off into the galaxy as a supposed trader. The first speaker said, Preem Palver had a specific purpose in doing so. Speaker Gendebal has not. If it appears a disguise of some sort is necessary, I am sure he will be ingenious enough to adopt one. With respect, first speaker, I wish to point out a subtle disguise. Preem Palver, you will remember, took with him his wife and companion of many years... Nothing so thoroughly established the rustic nature of his character as the fact that he was traveling with his wife. It allayed all suspicion. Gendeval said, I have no wife. I have had companions, but none who would now volunteer to assume the marital role. This is well known, Speaker Gendeval, said Delarmy. But then people will take the role for granted if any woman is with you. Surely some volunteer can be found. And if you feel the need to be able to present documentary evidence, that can be provided. 
I think a woman should come with you. For a moment, Jendabal was breathless. Surely she did not mean... Could it be a ploy to achieve a share in this success? Could she be playing for a joint or rotating occupation of the first speakership? Jendabal said grimly, I am flattered that Speaker Delarmy should feel that she... <laughs> and Delarmy broke into an open laugh and looked at Jendabal with what was almost true affection. He had fallen into the trap and looked foolish for having done so. The table would not forget that. She said, Speaker Jendabal, I would not have the impertinence to attempt to share in this task. It is yours and yours alone, as the post of first speaker will be yours and yours alone. I would not have thought you wanted me with you. Really, Speaker, at my age, I no longer think of myself as a charmer. There were smiles around the table, and even the first speaker tried to hide one. Jendabal felt the stroke and labored not to compound the loss by failing to match her lightness. It was labor lost. He said as unsavagely as he could, Then what is it you would suggest? It was not in my thoughts, I assure you, that you would wish to accompany me. You are at your best at the table and not in the hurly-burly of galactic affairs, I know. I agree, Speaker Jendabal, I agree, said Delarmy. My suggestion, however, refers back to your role as Hamish trader. To make it indisputably authentic, what better companion need you ask but a Hamish woman? A Hamish woman? For a second time in rapid succession, Jendabal was caught by surprise, and the table enjoyed it. The Hamish woman, Delarmy went on, the one who saved you from a beating, the one who gazes at you worshipfully, the one whose mind you probed, and who then quite unwittingly saved you a second time from considerably more than a beating. I suggest you take her. Jendabal's impulse was to refuse, but he knew that she expected that. It would mean more enjoyment for the table. It was clear now that the first speaker, anxious to strike out at Delarmy, had made a mistake by naming Jendabal his successor, or at the very least that Delarmy had quickly converted it into one. Jendabal was the youngest of the speakers. He had angered the table, and had then avoided conviction by them. In a very real way, he had humiliated them. None could see him as the heir apparent without resentment. That would have been hard enough to overcome, but now they would remember how easily Delarmy had twitched him into ridicule, and how much they had enjoyed it. She would use that to convince them all too easily that he lacked the age and experience for the role of first speaker. Their united pressure would force the first speaker into changing his decision while Jendabal was off on his mission. Or, if the first speaker held fast, Jendabal would eventually find himself with an office that would be forever helpless in the face of united opposition. He saw it all in an instant, and was able to answer as though without hesitation. He said, Speaker Delarmy, I admire your insight. I had thought to surprise you all. It was indeed my intention to take the Hamish woman, though not quite for the very good reason you suggest. It was for her mind that I wished to take her with me. You have all examined that mind. You saw it for what it was, surprisingly intelligent, but more than that, clear, simple, utterly without guile. No touch upon it by others would go unnoticed, as I'm sure you all concluded. I wonder if it occurred to you then, Speaker Delarmy, that she would serve as an excellent early warning system. I would detect the first symptomatic presence of mentalism by way of her mind, earlier, I think, than by way of mine. There was a kind of astonished silence at that, and he said lightly, Ah, none of you saw that. Well, well, not important. And I will take my leave now. There's no time to lose. Wait, said Delarmy, her initiative lost a third time. What do you intend to do? Jendabal said with a small shrug, Why go into details? The less the table knows, the less the anti-mules are likely to attempt to disturb it. He said it as though the safety of the table was his prime concern. He filled his mind with that and let it show. It would flatter them. More than that, the satisfaction it would bring might keep them from wondering whether, in fact, Jendabal knew exactly what it was he intended to do. 38. The first speaker spoke to Jendabal alone that evening. You are right, he said. I could not help brushing below the surface of your mind. I saw you considered the announcement a mistake, and it was. It was my eagerness to wipe that eternal smile off her face and to strike back at the casual way in which she so frequently usurps my role. Jendabal said gently, It might have been better if you had told me privately and had then waited for my return to go further. That would not have allowed me to strike out at her. Poor motivation for a first speaker, I know. This won't stop her, first speaker. She was still intrigued for the post, and perhaps with good reason. I'm sure there are some who would argue that I should have refused your nomination. It would not be hard to argue that Speaker Delarmy has the best mind at the table and would make the best first speaker. The best mind at the table, not away from it, grumbled Chandis. She recognizes no real enemies except for other speakers. She ought never to have been made a speaker in the first place. See here, shall I forbid you to take the Hamish woman? She maneuvered you into that, I know. 
No, no. The reason I advance for taking her is a true one. She will be an early warning system, and I am grateful to Speaker Delarmy for pushing me into realizing that. The woman will prove very useful, I'm convinced. Good, then. By the way, I wasn't lying either. I am truly certain that you will accomplish whatever is needed to end this crisis, if you can trust my intuition. I think I can trust it, for I agree with you. I promise you that whatever happens, I will return better than I receive. I will come back to be first speaker, whatever the anti-mules or Speaker Delarmy can do. Jendibal studied his own satisfaction even as he spoke. Why was he so pleased, so insistent on this one-ship venture into space? Ambition, of course. Preem Palver had once done just this sort of thing, and he was going to show that Stor Jendibal could do it too. No one could withhold the first speakership from him after that. And yet, was there more than ambition? The lure of combat? The generalized desire for excitement in one who had been confined to a hidden patch on a backward planet all his adult life? He didn't entirely know, but he knew he was desperately intent on going. Chapter 11 Seychelles 39 Genov Pellerat watched for the first time in his life as the bright star graduated into an orb after what Trevise had called a micro-jump. The fourth planet, the habitable one, and their immediate destination, Seychelles, then grew in size and prominence more slowly over a period of days. A map of the planet had been produced by the computer and was displayed on a portable screening device which Pellerat held in his lap. Trevis, with the aplomb of someone who had in his time touched down upon several dozen worlds, said, Don't start watching too hard too soon, Genov. We have to go through the entry station first, and that can be tedious. Pellerat looked up. Surely that's just a formality. It is, but it can still be tedious. But it's peacetime. Of course, that means we'll be passed through. First, though, there's a little matter of the ecological balance. Every planet has its own, and they don't want it upset. So they make a natural point of checking the ship for undesirable organisms or infections. It's a reasonable precaution. We don't have such things, it seems to me. No, we don't, and they'll find that out. Remember, too, that Seychelles is not a member of the Foundation Federation, so there's certain to be some leaning over backward to demonstrate their independence. A small ship came out to inspect them, and a Seychellian customs official boarded. Trevise was brisk, not having forgotten his military days. The Far Star out of Terminus, he said. Ship's papers. Unarmed. Private vessel. My passport. There is one passenger. His passport. We are tourists. The customs official wore a garish uniform in which crimson was the dominating color. Cheeks and upper lip were smooth-shaven, but he wore a short beard, parted in such a way that tufts thrust out to both sides of his chin. He said, Foundation ship? He pronounced it, Foundation ship? But Trevise was careful neither to correct him nor to smile. There were as many varieties of dialects to galactic standard as there were planets, and you just spoke your own. As long as there was cross-comprehension, it didn't matter. Yes, sir, said Trevis, foundation ship, privately owned. Very nice. You're leaving, if you please. My what? You're leaving. What are you carrying? Ah, oh, my cargo. Here is the itemized list. Personal property only. We are not here to trade. As I told you, we are simply tourists. The customs official looked about curiously. This is rather an elaborate vessel for tourists. Not by foundation standards, said Trevise, with a display of good humor. And I'm well off and can afford this. Are you suggesting that I might be richified? The official looked at him briefly, then looked away. Trevise hesitated a moment in order to interpret the meaning of the word, then another moment to decide his course of action. He said, No, it is not my intention to bribe you. I have no reason to bribe you, and you don't look like the kind of person who could be bribed, if that were my intention. You can look over the ship if you wish. No need, said the official, putting away his pocket recorder. You have already been examined for specific contraband infection and have passed. The ship has been assigned radio wavelength will serve as an approach beam. He left. The whole procedure had taken 15 minutes. Pellerat said in a low voice, Could he have made trouble? Did he really expect a bribe? Trevis shrugged. Tipping the customs man is as old as the galaxy, and they would have done it readily if he had made a second try for it. As it is, well, I presume he prefers not to take a chance with a Foundation ship and a fancy one at that. The old mayor, bless her cross-grained hide, said the name of the Foundation would protect us wherever we went, and she wasn't wrong. It could have taken a great deal longer. Why? He seemed to find out what he wanted to know. Yes, but he was courteous enough to check us by remote radio scanning. If he had wished, he could have gone over the ship with a hand machine and taken hours. He could have put us both in a field hospital and kept us days. What? Oh, my dear fellow! 
Don't get excited. He didn't do it. I thought he might, but he didn't, which means we're free to land. I'd like to go down gravitically, which could take us 15 minutes, but I don't know where the permitted landing sites might be, and I don't want to cause trouble. That means we'll have to follow the radio beam, which will take hours as we spiral down through the atmosphere. Pellerat looked cheerful. But that's excellent, Golan. Will we be going slowly enough to watch the terrain? He held up his portable view screen with the map spread out on it at low magnification. After a fashion, we'd have to get beneath the cloud deck, and we'll be moving at a few kilometers per second. It won't be ballooning through the atmosphere, but you'll spot the planetography. Excellent, excellent, Trevise said thoughtfully. I'm wondering, though, if we'll be on Seychelles planet long enough to make it worth our while to adjust the ship's clock to local time. It depends on what we plan to do, I suppose. What do you think we'll be doing, Golan? Our job is to find Gaia, and I don't know how long that will take. Pellerat said, We can adjust our wrist strips and leave the ship's clock as is. Good enough, said Trevise. He looked down at the planet spreading broadly beneath them. No use waiting any longer. I'll adjust the computer to our assigned radio beam, and it can use the gravitics to mimic conventional flight. So, let's go down, Genoff, and see what we can find. He stared at the planet thoughtfully as the ship began to move on its smoothly adjusted gravitational potential curve. Trevise had never been in the Seychelles Union, but he knew that over the last century it had been steadfastly unfriendly to the Foundation. He was surprised and a little dismayed they had gotten through customs so quickly. It didn't seem reasonable. 40. The customs official's name was Jogoroth Sabhadarta, and he had been serving on the station on and off for half his life. He didn't mind the life, for it gave him a chance one month out of three to view his books, to listen to his music, and to be away from his wife and growing son. Of course, during the last two years, the current head of customs had been a dreamer, which was irritating. There is no one so insufferable as a person who gives no other excuse for a peculiar action than saying he had been directed to it in a dream. Personally, Sabatarta had decided he believed none of it, though he was careful not to say so aloud, since most people on Seychelles rather disapproved of anti-psychic doubts. To become known as a materialist might put his forthcoming pension at risk. He stroked the two tufts of hair at his chin, one with his right hand and the other with his left, cleared his throat rather loudly, and then with inappropriate casualness said, Was that the ship head? The head, who bore the equally Seychellian name of Namarath Gadsivata, was concerned with a matter involving some computer-borne data and did not look up. What ship? he said. The Far Star, the Foundation ship, the one I just sent past, the one that was holographed from every angle. Was that the one you dreamed of? Godisavata looked up now. He was a small man, with eyes that were almost black and were surrounded by fine wrinkles that had not been produced by any pension for smiling. He said, Why do you ask? Sabadatta straightened up and allowed his dark and luxuriant eyebrows to approach each other. They said they were tourists, but I've never seen a ship like that before, and my own opinion is they're Foundation agents. Godisavata sat back in his chair. See here, my man. Try as I might. I cannot recall asking for your opinion. But, Head, I consider it my patriotic duty to point out that... Godisavata crossed his arms over his chest and stared hard at the underling, who, though much the more impressive in physical stature and bearing, allowed himself to droop and take on a somehow bedraggled appearance under the gaze of his superior. Godisavata said, My man, if you know what is good for you, you will do your job without comment or I'll see to it that there will be no pension when you retire, which will be soon if I hear any more on a subject that does not concern you. In a low voice, Sopadarta said, Biffler. Then, with a suspicious degree of subservience in his voice, he added, Is it within the range of my duty, sir, to report that a second ship is in range of our screens? Consider it reported, Gadisavata said irritably, returning to his work. With, Sopadarta, even more humbly, characteristics very similar to the one I just sent through. Gaudisavarta placed his hands on the desk and lifted himself to his feet. A second one? Sabadarta smiled inwardly. That sanguinary person, born of an irregular union, he was referring to the head, had clearly not dreamed of two ships. He said, Apparently, sir, I will now return to my post and await orders, and I hope, sir... Yes? Sabadarta could not resist, pension risk notwithstanding... And I hope, sir, we didn't send the wrong one through. 41. The Far Star moved rapidly across the face of Seychelles Planet, and Pellerat watched with fascination. 
The cloud layer was thinner and more scattered than upon Terminus, and precisely as the map showed, the land surfaces were more compact and extensive, including broader desert areas to judge by the rusty color of much of the continental expanse. There were no signs of anything living. It seemed a world of sterile desert, gray plain of endless wrinkles that might have represented mountainous areas, and, of course, of ocean. It looks lifeless, muttered Pellerat. You don't expect to see any life signs at this height, said Trevise. As we get lower, you'll see the land turn green in patches. Before that, in fact, you'll see the twinkling landscape on the night side. Human beings have a penchant for lighting their worlds when darkness falls. I've never heard of a world that's an exception to that rule. In other words, the first sign of life you'll see will not only be human, but technological. Pellerat said thoughtfully, Human beings are diurnal in nature, after all. It seems to me that among the very first tasks of a developing technology would be the conversion of night to day. In fact, if a world lacked technology and developed one, you ought to be able to follow the progress of technological development by the increase in light upon the darkened surface. How long would it take, do you suppose, to go from uniform darkness to uniform light? Trevise laughed. You have odd thoughts, but I suppose that comes from being a mythologist. I don't think a world would ever achieve a uniform glow. Night light would follow the pattern of population density, so that the continents would spark in knots and strings. Even Trantor, at its height, when it was one huge structure, let light escape that structure only at scattered points. The land turned green, as Trevise had predicted, and on the last circling of the globe, he pointed out markings that he said were cities. It's not a very urban world. I've never been in the Seychelles Union before, but according to the information the computer gives me, they tend to cling to the past. Technology, in the eyes of all the galaxy, has been associated with the Foundation, and wherever the Foundation is unpopular, there is a tendency to cling to the past, except, of course, as far as weapons of war are concerned. I assure you, Seychelles is quite modern in that respect. Dear me, Colin, this is not going to be unpleasant, is it? We are Foundationers, after all, and being in enemy territory... <laughs> it's not enemy territory, Janov. They'll be perfectly polite, never fear. The Foundation just isn't popular, that's all. Seychelles is not part of the Foundation Federation. Therefore, because they're proud of their independence, and because they don't like to remember that they are much weaker than the Foundation, and remain independent only because we're willing to let them remain so, they indulge in the luxury of disliking us. I fear it will still be unpleasant, then, said Pallarat despondently. Not at all, said Trevise. Come on, Janoff. I'm talking about the official attitude of the Seychellian government. The individual people on the planet are just people, and if we're pleasant and don't act as though we're lords of the galaxy, they'll be pleasant too. We're not coming to Seychelles in order to establish foundation mastery. We're just tourists, asking the kind of questions about Seychelles that any tourist would ask. And we can have a little legitimate relaxation, too, if the situation permits. There's nothing wrong with staying here a few days and experiencing what they have to offer. They may have an interesting culture, interesting scenery, interesting food, and if all else fails, interesting women. We have money to spend. Pellerat frowned. Oh, my dear chap. Come on, said Trevise. You're not that old. Wouldn't you be interested? Well, I don't say there wasn't a time when I played that role properly, but surely this isn't the time for it. We have a mission. We want to reach Gaia. I have nothing against a good time. I really don't. But if we start involving ourselves, it might be difficult to pull free. He shook his head and said mildly, I think you feared that I might have too good a time at the Galactic Library on Trantor and would be unable to pull free. Surely, what the library is to me, an attractive, dark-eyed damsel, or five or six, might be to you. Trevise said, I'm not a rake Janoff, but I have no intention of being ascetic either. Very well, I promise you we'll get on with this business of Gaia, but if something pleasant comes my way, there's no reason in the galaxy I ought not to respond normally. If you'll just put Gaia first, I will. Just remember, though, don't tell anyone we're from the Foundation. They'll know we are, because we've got Foundation credits and we speak with strong Terminus accents. But if we say nothing about it, they can pretend we are placeless strangers and be friendly. If we make a point of being Foundationers, they will speak politely enough, but they will tell us nothing, show us nothing, take us nowhere, and leave us strictly alone. Pallarat sighed. I will never understand people. There's nothing to it. All you have to do is take a close look at yourself, and you will understand everyone else. We're in no way different ourselves. How would Selden have worked out his plan, and I don't care how subtle his mathematics was, if he didn't understand people? And how could he have done that if people weren't easy to understand? You show me someone who can't understand people, and I'll show you someone who has built up a false image of himself. No offense intended. None taken. 
I'm willing to admit I'm inexperienced and that I've spent a rather self-centered and constricted life. It may be that I've never really taken a good look at myself. So I'll let you be my guide and advisor where people are concerned. Good. Then take my advice now and just watch the scenery. We'll be landing soon, and I assure you, you'll feel nothing. The computer and I will take care of everything. Conan, don't be annoyed. If a young woman should... Forget it. Just let me take care of the landing. Colorat turned to look at the world at the end of the ship's contracting spiral. It would be the first foreign world upon which he would ever stand. The thought somehow filled him with foreboding, despite the fact that all the millions of inhabited planets in the galaxy had been colonized by people who had not been born upon them. All but one, he thought with a shudder of trepidation, delight. 42. The spaceport was not large by Foundation standards, but it was well kept. Trevise watched the far star moved into a berth and locked in place. They were given an elaborate coded receipt. Pellerette said in a low voice, Do we just leave it here? Trevise nodded and placed his hand on the other's shoulder in reassurance. Don't worry, he said in an equally low voice. They stepped into the ground car they had rented, and Trevise plugged in the map of the city, whose towers he could see on the horizon. Seychelles City, he said, the capital of the planet. City, planet, star, all named Seychelles. I'm worried about the ship, insisted Pellerat. Nothing to worry about, said Trevise. We'll be back tonight, because it will be our sleeping quarters if we have to stay here more than a few hours. You have to understand, too, that there's an interstellar code of spaceport ethics that, as far as I know, has never been broken, even in wartime. Spaceships that come in peace are inviolate. If that were not so, no one would be safe, and trade would be impossible. Any world on which that code was broken would be boycotted by the space pilots of the galaxy. I assure you, no world would risk that. Besides, besides, well, besides, I've arranged with the computer that anyone who doesn't look and sound like one of us will be killed if he or she tries to board the ship. I've taken the liberty of explaining that to the port commander. I told him very politely that I would love to turn off that particular facility out of deference to the reputation that the Seychelles City spaceports hold for absolute integrity and security throughout the galaxy, I said. But the ship is a new model, and I didn't know how to turn it off. He didn't believe that, surely. Of course not. But he had to pretend he did, as otherwise he would have no choice but to be insulted. And since there would be nothing he could do about that, being insulted would only lead to humiliation. And since he didn't want that, the simplest path to follow was to believe what I said. And that's another example of how people are? Yes. You'll get used to this. How do you know this ground car isn't bugged? I thought it might be. So when they offered me one, I took another one at random. If they're all bugged, well, what have we been saying that's so terrible? Pellerat looked unhappy. I don't know how to say this. It seems rather impolite to complain, but I don't like the way it smells. There's an odor. In the ground car? Well, in the spaceport to begin with. I suppose that's the way spaceports smell, but the ground car carries the odor with it. Could we open the windows? Trevise laughed. <laughs> I suppose I could figure out which portion of the control panel will do that trick, but it won't help. This planet stinks. Is it very bad? Well, it's not very strong, but it's noticeable and somewhat repulsive. Does the whole world smell this way? I keep forgetting you've never been on another world. Every inhabited world has its own order. It's the general vegetation mostly, though I suppose the animals and even the human beings contribute. As far as I know, nobody ever likes the smell of any world when he first lands on it. But you'll get used to it, Genoff. In a few hours, I promise you won't notice. Surely you don't mean that all worlds smell like this? No. As I said, each has its own. If we really paid attention, or if our noses were a little keener like those of an Acreonian dogs, we could probably tell which world we were on with one sniff. When I first entered the Navy, I could never eat the first day on a new world. Then I learned the old spacer trick of sniffing a handkerchief with the world scent on it during the landing. By the time you get out into the open world, you don't smell it. And after a while, you get hardened to the whole thing. You just learn to disregard it. The worst of it is returning home, in fact. Why? Do you think Terminus doesn't smell? Are you telling me it does? Of course it does. Once you get acclimated to the smell of another world, such as Seychelles, you will be surprised at the stench of Terminus. In the old days, whenever the locks opened on Terminus after a sizable tour of duty, all the crew would call out, Back home to the crap. Pellerat looked revolted. The towers of the city were perceptibly closer, but Pellerat kept his eyes fixed on their immediate surroundings. There were other ground cars moving in both directions, and an occasional air car above, but Pellerat was studying the trees. He said, The plant life seems strange. Do you suppose any of it is indigenous? 
I doubt it, said Treviz absently. He was studying the map and attempting to adjust the programming of the car's computer. There's not much in the way of indigenous life on any human planet. Settlers always imported their own plants and animals, either at the time of settling or not too long afterward. It seems strange, though. You don't expect the same varieties from world to world, Janoff. I was once told that the Encyclopedia Galactica people put out an atlas of varieties which ran to 87 fat computer disks and was incomplete even so, and outdated anyway by the time it was finished. The ground car moved on, and the outskirts of the city gaped and engulfed them. Pellerat shivered slightly. I don't think much of their city architecture. To each his own, said Treviz with the indifference of the seasoned space traveler. Where are we going, by the way? Well, said Treviz with a certain exasperation, I'm trying to get the computer to guide this thing to the tourist center. I hope the computer knows the one-way streets and the traffic regulations, because I don't. What do we do there, Golan? To begin with, we're tourists, so that's the place where we'd naturally go, and we want to be as inconspicuous and natural as we can. And secondly, where would you go to get information on Gaia? Pellerette said, to a university, or an anthropological society, or a museum. Certainly not to a tourist center. Well, you're wrong. At the tourist center, we will be intellectual types who are eager to have a listing of the universities in the city and the museums and so on. We'll decide where to go first, and there we may find the proper people to consult concerning ancient history, galactography, mythology, anthropology, or anything else you can think of. But the whole thing starts at the tourist center. Pellerat was silent, and the ground car moved on in a tortuous manner as it joined and became part of the traffic pattern. They plunged into a sub-road and drove past signs that might have represented directions and traffic instructions, but were in a style of lettering that made them all but unreadable. Fortunately, the ground car behaved as though it knew the way, and when it stopped and drew itself into a parking spot, there was a sign that said, Seychelles Outworld Milieu, in the same difficult printing, and under it, Seychelles Tourist Center, in straightforward, easy-to-read, galactic standard lettering. They walked into the building, which was not as large as the facade had led them to believe. It was certainly not busy inside. There were a series of waiting booths, one of which was occupied by a man reading the news strips emerging from a small ejector. Another contained two women who seemed to be playing some intricate game with cards and tiles. Behind a counter too large for him, with winking computer controls that seemed far too complex for him, was a bored-looking Seychellian functionary wearing what looked like a multicolored checkerboard. Pellerat stared and whispered, This is certainly a world of extroverted garb. Yes, said Treviz, I noticed. Still, fashions change from world to world, and even from region to region within a world sometimes, and they change with time. Fifty years ago, everyone on Seychelles might have worn black, for all we know. Take it as it comes, Genoff. I suppose I'll have to, said Pellerat, but I prefer our own fashions. At least they're not an assault upon the optic nerve. Because so many of us are gray on gray? That offends some people. I've heard it referred to as dressing in dirt. Then, too, it's foundation colorlessness that probably keeps these people in their rainbows just to emphasize their independence. It's all what you're accustomed to anyway. Come on, Jenna. The two headed toward the counter, and as they did so, the man in the booth forsook his news items, rose, and came to meet them, smiling as he did so. His clothing was in shades of gray. Trevise didn't look in his direction first, but when he did, he stopped dead. He took a deep breath. By the galaxy... My friend, the traitor. Chapter 12. Agent. 43. Mun Lee Kampor, councilman of Terminus, looked uncertain as he extended his right hand to Treviz. Treviz looked at the hand sternly and did not take it. He said apparently to open air, I am in no position to create a situation in which I may find myself arrested for disturbing the peace on a foreign planet, but I will do so anyway if this individual comes a step closer. Kampor stopped abruptly, hesitated, and finally said in a low voice after glancing uncertainly at Pellerat, Am I to have a chance to talk, to explain? Will you listen? Pellerat looked from one to the other with a slight frown on his long face. He said, What's all this, Golan? Have we come to this far world and at once met someone you know? Treviz's eyes remained firmly fixed on Kampor, but he twisted his body slightly to make it clear that he was talking to Pellerat. Treviz said, This human being we would judge that much from his shape, was once a friend of mine on Terminus. As is my habit with my friends, I trusted him. I told him my views, which were perhaps not the kind that should have received a general airing. He told them to the authorities in great detail, apparently, and did not take the trouble to tell me he had done so. For that reason, I walked neatly into a trap 
And now I find myself in exile. And now this human being wishes to be recognized as a friend. He turned to Kampor full on and brushed his fingers through his hair, succeeding only in disarranging the curls further. See here, you. I do have a question for you. What are you doing here? Of all the worlds in the galaxy on which you could be, why are you on this one, and why now? Kampor's hand, which had remained outstretched throughout Trevisa's speech, now fell to his side, and the smile left his face. The air of self-confidence, which was ordinarily so much a part of him, was gone, and in its absence he looked younger than his thirty-four years, and a bit woebegone. I'll explain, he said, but only from the start. Trevise looked about briefly. Here? You really want to talk about it here, in a public place? You want me to knock you down here after I've listened to enough of your lies? Kampor lifted both hands now, palms facing each other. It's the safest place, believe me. And then, checking himself and realizing what the other was about to say, added hurriedly, Oh, don't believe me. It doesn't matter. I'm telling the truth. I've been on the planet several hours longer than you, and I've checked it out. This is some particular day they have here on Seychelles. It's a day for meditation, for some reason. Almost everyone is at home, or should be. You see how empty this place is. You don't suppose it's like this every day? Pellerad nodded and said, I was wondering why it was so empty at that. He leaned toward Trevise's ear and whispered, Why not let him talk, Golan? He looks miserable, poor chap, and he may be trying to apologize. It seems unfair not to give him the chance to do so. Trevise said, Dr. Pellerat seems anxious to hear you. I'm willing to oblige him, but you'll oblige me if you're brief about it. This may be a good day on which to lose my temper. If everyone is meditating, any disturbance I cause may not produce the guardians of the law. I may not be so lucky tomorrow. Why waste an opportunity? Kampor said in a strained voice, Look, if you want to take a poke at me, do so. I won't even defend myself. See? Go ahead, hit me, but listen. Go ahead and talk, then. I'll listen for a while. In the first place, Golan, address me as Trevise, please. I am not on first-name terms with you. In the first place, Trevise, you did too good a job convincing me of your views. You hid that well. I could have sworn you were amused by me. I tried to be amused to hide from myself the fact that you were being extremely disturbing. Look, let us sit down up against the wall. Even if the place is empty, some few may come in, and I don't think we ought to be needlessly conspicuous. Slowly the three men walked most of the length of the large room. Kampor was smiling tentatively again, but remained carefully at more than arm's length from Trevise. They sat, each on a seat, that gave as their weight was placed upon it, and molded itself into the shape of their hips and buttocks. Pellerat looked surprised and made as though to stand up. Relax, Professor, said Kampor. I've been through this already. They're in advance of us in some ways. It's a world that believes in small comforts. He turned to Trevise, placing one arm over the back of his chair and speaking easily now. You disturbed me. You made me feel the second foundation did exist, and that was deeply upsetting. Consider the consequences if they did. Wasn't it likely that they might take care of you somehow, remove you as a menace? And if I behaved as though I believed you, I might be removed as well. Do you see my point? I see a coward. What good would it do to be storybook brave, said Kampor warmly, his blue eyes widening in indignation. Can you or I stand up to an organization capable of molding our minds and emotions? The only way we could fight effectively would be to hide our knowledge to begin with. So you did it and were safe? Yet you didn't hide it from Mayor Brano, did you? Quite a risk there. Yes, but I thought that was worth it. Just talking between ourselves might do nothing more than get ourselves mentally controlled or our memories erased altogether. If I told the mayor, on the other hand, she knew my father well, you know. My father and I were immigrants from Smyrna, and the mayor had a grandmother who... Yes, yes, said Trevise impatiently. And several generations farther back, you can trace ancestry to the Syria sector. You've told all that to everyone you know. Get on with it, Campor. Well, I had her ear. If I could convince the mayor that there was danger using your arguments, the Federation might take some action. We're not as helpless as we were in the days of the mule, and, at the worst, this dangerous knowledge would be spread more widely, and we ourselves would not be in as much specific danger. Trevise said sardonically, Endanger the Foundation, but keep ourselves safe. That's good patriotic stuff. That would be at the worst. I was counting on the best. His forehead had become a little damp. He seemed to be straining against Trevise's immovable contempt. And you didn't tell me of this clever plan of yours, did you? No, I didn't. And I'm sorry about that, Trevise. The mayor ordered me not to. She said she wanted to know everything you knew, but that you were the sort of person who would freeze if you knew that your remarks were being passed on. How right she was. I didn't know. I couldn't guess. I had no way of conceiving that she was planning to arrest you and throw you off the planet. 
She was waiting for the right political moment when my status as councilman would not protect me. You didn't foresee that? How could I? You yourself did not. Had I known that she knew my views, I would have. Kampor said with a sudden trace of insolence, That's easy enough to say, in hindsight. And what is it you want of me here, now that you have a bit of hindsight, too? To make up for all this, to make up for the harm I unwittingly, unwittingly, did you? Goodness, said Trevise dryly, how kind of you. But you haven't answered my original question. How did you come to be here? How do you happen to be on the very planet I am on? Kampor said, there's no complicated answer necessary for that. I followed you. Through hyperspace, with my ship making jumps in series. Kampor shook his head. No mystery. I have the same kind of ship you do, with the same kind of computer. You know, I've always had this trick of being able to guess in which direction, through hyperspace, a ship would go. It's not usually a very good guess, and I'm wrong two times out of three. But with the computer, I'm much better. And you hesitated quite a bit at the start, and gave me a chance to evaluate the direction and speed in which you are going before entering hyperspace. I fed the data, together with my own intuitive extrapolations, into the computer, and it did the rest. And you actually got to the city ahead of me? Yes. You didn't use gravitics, and I did. I guessed you would come to the capital city, so I went straight down, while you... Kampor made a short spiral motion with his finger, as though it were a ship riding a directional beam. You took a chance on a run-in with Seychelles and officialdom? Well... Kampor's face broke into a smile that lent it an undeniable charm, and Trevise felt himself almost warming to him. Kampor said, I'm not a coward at all times and in all things. Trevise steeled himself. How did you happen to get a ship like mine? In precisely the same way you got a ship like yours. The old lady, uh, Mayor Brano, assigned it to me. Why? I'm being entirely frank with you. My assignment was to follow you. The mayor wanted to know where you were going and what you would be doing. And you've been reporting faithfully to her, I suppose. Or have you been faithless to the mayor also? I reported to her. I had no choice, actually. She placed a hyper-relay on board ship, which I wasn't supposed to find, but which I did find. Well? Unfortunately, it's hooked up so that I can't remove it without immobilizing the vessel. At least, there's no way I can remove it. Consequently, she knows where I am, and she knows where you are. Suppose you hadn't been able to follow me. Then she wouldn't have known where I was, had you thought of that. Of course I did. I thought of just reporting I had lost you. But she wouldn't have believed me, would she? And I wouldn't have been able to get back to Terminus for who knows how long. And I'm not like you, Trevise. I'm not a carefree person without attachments. I have a wife on Terminus, a pregnant wife, and I want to get back to her. You can afford to think only of yourself. I can't. Besides, I've come to warn you. By Sheldon, I'm trying to do that, and you won't listen. You keep talking about other things. I'm not impressed by your sudden concern for me. What can you warn me against? It seems to me that you are the only thing I need to be warned about. You betray me, and now you follow me in order to betray me again. No one else is doing me any harm. Kampor said earnestly, Forget the dramatics, man. Travis, you're a lightning rod. You've been sent out to draw a second foundation response, if there is such a thing as a second foundation. I have an intuitive sense for things other than hyperspatial pursuit, and I'm sure that's what she's planning. If you try to find the second foundation, they'll become aware of it, and they'll act against you. If they do, they are very likely to tip their hand, and when they do, Mayor Brano will go for them. A pity your famous intuition wasn't working when Brano was planning my arrest. Kampor flushed and muttered, You know it doesn't always work. And now it tells you she's planning to attack the Second Foundation. She wouldn't dare. I think she would. But that's not the point. The point is that right now she is throwing you out as bait. So? So, by all the black holes in space, don't search for the Second Foundation. She won't care if you're killed in the search, but I care. I feel responsible for this, and I care. I'm touched, said Dravise coldly. But as it happens, I have another task on hand at the moment. You have? Pellerat and I are on the track of Earth, the planet that some think was the original home of the human race. Aren't we, Janoff? Pellerat nodded his head. Yes, it's a purely scientific matter and a long-standing interest of mine. Kampor looked blank for a moment, then... Looking for Earth... But why? To study it, said Pellerat, as the one world on which human beings developed, presumably from lower forms of life, instead of, as on all others, merely arriving ready-made. It should be a fascinating study in uniqueness. And, said Trevise, as a world where, just possibly, I may learn more of the second foundation. Just possibly. Kampor said, But there isn't any earth. Didn't you know that? No earth? 
Pellerat looked utterly blank, as he always did when he was preparing to be stubborn. Are you saying there was no planet on which the human species originated? Oh, no, of course there was an Earth. There's no question of that. But there isn't any Earth now, no inhabited Earth. It's gone, Pellerat said, unmoved. There are tales. Hold on, Janov, said Trevis. Tell me, Kampor, how do you know this? What do you mean, how? It's my heritage. I trace my ancestry from the Syria sector, if I may repeat that fact without boring you. We know all about Earth out there. It exists in that sector, which means it's not part of the Foundation Federation, so apparently no one on Terminus bothers with it. But that's where Earth is, just the same. That is one suggestion, yes, said Pellerin. There was considerable enthusiasm for that serious alternative, as they called it, in the days of the Empire. Campo said vehemently, It's not an alternative, it's a fact. Pellerin said, What would you say if I told you I know of many different places in the galaxy that are called Earth, or were called Earth, by the people who lived in its stellar neighborhood? But this is the real thing, said Campor. The Syria sector is the longest inhabited portion of the galaxy. Everyone knows that. The Syrians claim it, certainly, said Pellerat, unmoved. Campor looked frustrated. I tell you, but Trevise said, tell us what happened to Earth. You say it's not inhabited any longer. Why not? Radioactivity. The whole planetary surface is radioactive because of nuclear reactions that went out of control, or nuclear explosions, I'm not sure, and now no life is possible there. The three stared at each other for a while, and then Campor felt it necessary to repeat. He said, I tell you, there's no Earth. There's no use looking for it. 44. Janov Pellerat's face was, for once, not expressionless. It was not that there was passion in it or any of the more unstable emotions. It was that his eyes had narrowed and that a kind of fierce intensity had filled every plane of his face. He said, and his voice lacked any trace of its usual tentative quality, How did you say you know all this? I told you, said Campor. It's my heritage. Don't be silly, young man. You are a councilman. That means you must be born on one of the Federation worlds. A Smyrno, I think you said earlier. That's right. Well, then, what heritage are you talking about? Are you telling me that you possess Syrian genes that fill you with inborn knowledge of the Syrian myths concerning Earth? Campor looked taken aback. No, of course not. Then what are you talking about? Campor paused and seemed to gather his thoughts. He said quietly, My family has old books of Syrian history. An external heritage, not an internal one. It's not something we talk about outside, especially if one is intent on political advancement. Travis seems to think I am, but believe me, I mention it only to good friends. There was a trace of bitterness in his voice. Theoretically, all Foundation citizens are alike, but those from the old worlds of the Federation are more alike than those from the newer ones, and those that trace from worlds outside the Federation are least alike of all. But never mind that. Aside from the books, I once visited the old worlds. Trevise, hey there. Trevise had wandered off toward one end of the room, looking out a triangular window. It served to let in a view of the sky and to diminish the view of the city, more light and more privacy. Trevise stretched upward to look down. He returned through the empty room. Interesting window design, he said. You called me, Councilman? Yes. Remember the post-collegiate tour I took? After graduation, I remember very well. We were pals, pals forever, foundation of trust, two against the world. You went off on your tour. I joined the Navy, full of patriotism. Somehow I didn't think I wanted to tour with you. Some instinct told me not to. I wish the instinct had stayed with me. Campor did not rise to the bait. He said, I visited Camporion. Family tradition said that my ancestors had come from there, at least on my father's side. We were of the ruling family in ancient times, before the Empire absorbed us, and my name is derived from the world, or so the family tradition has it. We had an old poetic name for the star Campore encircled, Epsilon Eridani. What does that mean? asked Pellerat. Campo shook his head. I don't know that it has any meaning, just tradition. They live with a great deal of tradition. It's an old world. They have long, detailed records of Earth's history, but no one talks about it much. They're superstitious about it. Every time they mention the word, they lift up both hands with first and second fingers crossed to ward off misfortune. Did you tell this to anyone when you came back? Of course not. Who would be interested? And I wasn't going to force the tale on anyone. No, thank you. I had a political career to develop, and the last thing I want is to stress my foreign origin. What about the satellite? Describe Earth's satellite, said Pellerat sharply. Campor looked astonished. 
I don't know anything about that. Does it have one? I don't recall reading or hearing about it, but I'm sure if you consult the Comporionian records, you can find out. But you know nothing? Not about the satellite, not that I recall. Hmm. How did Earth come to be radioactive? Compor shook his head and said nothing. Pellaret said, Think, you must have heard something. It was seven years ago, Professor. I didn't know then you'd be questioning me about it now. There was some sort of legend. They considered it history. What was the legend? Earth was radioactive, ostracized and mistreated by the Empire, its population dwindling, and it was going to destroy the Empire somehow. One dying world was going to destroy the whole Empire, interposed Trevise. Campor said defensively, I said it was a legend. I don't know the details. Del Avedon was involved in the tale, I know. Who was he? asked Trevise. A historical character. I looked him up. He was an honest-to-galaxy archaeologist back in the early days of the Empire, and he maintained that Earth was in the Syria sector. I've heard the name, said Pellaret. He's a folk hero on Comporion. Look, if you want to know these things, go to Comporion. It's no use hanging around here. Pellaret said, Just how did they say Earth planned to destroy the Empire? Don't know. A certain sullenness was entering Campor's voice. Did the radiation have anything to do with it? Don't know. There were tales of some mind expander developed on Earth, a synapsifier or something. Did it create superminds? said Pellaret in deepest tones of incredulity. I don't think so. What I chiefly remember is that it didn't work. People became bright and died young. Trevise said, It was probably a morality myth. If you ask for too much, you lose even that which you have. Pellaret turned on Trevise in annoyance. What do you know of morality myths? Trevise raised his eyebrows. Your field may not be my field, Genov, but that doesn't mean I'm totally ignorant. What else do you remember about what you call the synapsifier, Councilman Campor? said Pellaret. Nothing, and I won't submit to any further cross-examination. Look, I followed you on orders from the mayor. I was not ordered to make personal contact with you. I have done so only to warn you that you were followed and tell you that you have been sent out to serve the mayor's purposes, whatever those might be. There was nothing else I should have discussed with you, but you surprised me by suddenly bringing up the matter of Earth. Well, let me repeat. Whatever there has existed there in the past, Bel Avedon, the Synapsifier, whatever, that has nothing to do with what exists now. I tell you again, Earth is a dead world. I strongly advise you to go to Comporion, where you'll find out everything you want to know. Just get away from here. And, of course, you will dutifully tell the mayor that we're going to Comporion, and you'll follow us to make sure. Or maybe the mayor knows already. I imagine she has carefully instructed and rehearsed you in every word you have spoken to us here, because for her own purposes it's in Comporion that she wants us, right? Campor's face paled. He rose to his feet and almost stuttered in his effort to control his voice. I've tried to explain. I've tried to be helpful. I shouldn't have tried. You can drop yourself into a black hole, Travis. He turned on his heel and walked away briskly without looking back. Pellaret seemed a bit stunned. That was rather tactless of you, Golan, old fellow. I could have gotten more out of him. No, you couldn't, said Trevise gravely. You could not have gotten one thing out of him that he was not ready to let you have. Janoff, you don't know what he is. Until today, I didn't know what he is. 45. Pellaret hesitated to disturb Trevise. Trevise sat motionless in his chair, deep in thought. Finally, Pellaret said, Are we just sitting here all night, Golan? Trevise started. No, you're quite right. We'll be better off with people around us. Come. Pellerat rose. He said, There won't be people around us. Campor said this was some sort of meditation day. Is that what he said? Was there traffic when we came along the road in our ground car? Yes, some. Quite a bit, I thought. And then, when we entered the city, was it empty? Not particularly. Still, you've got to admit that this place has been empty. Yes, it has. I noticed that particularly. But come, Genoff, I'm hungry. There's got to be some place to eat, and we can afford to find something good. At any rate, we can find a place in which we can try some interesting Seychellian novelty, or if we lose our nerve, good standard galactic fare. Come, once we're safely surrounded, I'll tell you what I think really happened here. 46. Trevise leaned back with a pleasant feeling of renewal. The restaurant was not expensive by Terminus standards, but it was certainly novel. It was heated in part by an open fire over which food was prepared. Meat tended to be served in bite-sized portions in a variety of pungent sauces, which were picked up by fingers that were protected from grease and heat by smooth green leaves that were cold, damp, and had a vaguely minty taste. It was one leaf to each meat bit, and the whole was taken into the mouth. 
The waiter had carefully explained how it had to be done. Apparently accustomed to off-planet guests, he had smiled paternally as Trevise and Pellaret gingerly scooped at the steaming bits of meat, and was clearly delighted at the foreigner's relief at finding that the leaves kept the fingers cool and cooled the meat, too, as one chewed. Trevise said, delicious, and eventually ordered a second helping. So did Pellaret. They sat over a spongy, vaguely sweet dessert and a cup of coffee that had a caramelized flavor at which they shook dubious heads. They added syrup, at which the waiter shook his head. Pellaret said, well, what happened back there at the tourist center? You mean with Kampor? Was there anything else there we might discuss? Trevise looked about. They were in a deep alcove and had a certain limited privacy, but the restaurant was crowded and the natural hum of noise was a perfect cover. He said in a low voice, Isn't it strange that he followed us to Seychelles? He said he had this intuitive ability. Yes, he was all collegiate champion at hypertracking. I never questioned that till today. I quite see that you might be able to judge where someone was going to jump by how he prepared for it if you had a certain developed skill at it, certain reflexes. But I don't see how a tracker can judge a jump series. You prepare only for the first one. The computer does all the others. The tracker can judge that first one. But by what magic can he guess what's in the computer's vitals? But he did it, Golan. He certainly did, said Trevise. And the only possible way I can imagine him doing so is by knowing in advance where we were going to go, by knowing, not judging. Pellerat considered that. Quite impossible, my boy. How could he know? We didn't decide on our destination till after we were on board the Far Star. I know that. And what about this day of meditation? Campo didn't lie to us. The waiter said it was a day of meditation when we came in here and asked him. Yes, he did. But he said the restaurant wasn't closed. In fact, what he said was, Seychelles City isn't the backwoods. It doesn't close down. People meditate, in other words, but not in the big town, where everyone is sophisticated and there's no place for small-town piety. So there's traffic, and it's busy. Well, perhaps not quite as busy as on ordinary days, but busy. But, Colin, no one came into the tourist center while we were there. I was aware of that. Not one person entered. I noticed that, too. I even went to the window at one point and looked out and saw clearly that the streets around the center had a good scattering of people on foot and in vehicles, and yet not one person entered. The day of meditation made a good cover. We would not have questioned the fortunate privacy we had if I simply hadn't made up my mind not to trust that son of two strangers. Bellaret said, What is the significance of all this, then? I think it's simple, Genov. We have here someone who knows where we're going as soon as we do, even though he and we are in separate spaceships, and we also have here someone who can keep a public building empty when it is surrounded by people, in order that we might talk in convenient privacy. Would you have me believe he can perform miracles? Certainly. If it so happens that Kampor is an agent of the Second Foundation and can control minds, if he can read yours and mine in a distant spaceship, if he can influence his way through a customs station at once, if he can land gravitically with no border patrol outraged at his defiance of the radio beams, and if he can influence minds in such a way as to keep people from entering a building he doesn't want entered. By all the stars, Trevise went on with a marked air of grievance, I can even follow this back to graduation. I didn't go on the tour with him. I remember not wanting to. Wasn't that a matter of his influence? He had to be alone. Where was he really going? Pellerat pushed away the dishes before him, as though he wanted to clear a space about himself in order to have room to think. It seemed to be a gesture that signaled the busboy robot, a self-moving table that stopped near them and waited while they placed their dishes and cutlery upon it. When they were alone, Pellerat said, But that's mad. Nothing has happened that could not have happened naturally. Once you get it into your head that somebody is controlling events, you can interpret everything in that light and find no reasonable certainty anywhere. Come on, old fellow, it's all circumstantial and a matter of interpretation. Don't yield to paranoia. I'm not going to yield to complacency either. Well, let's look at this logically. Suppose he was an agent of the Second Foundation. Why would he run the risk of rousing our suspicions by keeping the tourist center empty? What did he say that was so important that a few people at a distance, who would have been wrapped in their own concerns anyway, would have made a difference? There's an easy answer to that, Genoff. He would have to keep our minds under close observation, and he wanted no interference from other minds, no static, no chance of confusion. Again, just your interpretation. What was so important about his conversation with us? It would make sense to suppose, as he himself insisted, that he met us only in order to explain what he had done, to apologize for it, and to warn us of the trouble that might await us. Why would we have to look further than that? 
The small card receptacle at the farther rim of the table glittered unobtrusively, and the figures representing the cost of the meal flashed briefly. Trevise groped beneath his sash for his credit card, which with its foundation imprint was good anywhere in the galaxy, or anywhere a foundation citizen was likely to go. He inserted it in the appropriate slot. It took a moment to complete the transaction, and Trevise, with native caution, checked on the remaining balance before returning it to its pocket. He looked about casually to make sure there was no undesirable interest in him on the faces of any of the few who still sat in the restaurant, and then said, Why look further than that? Why look further? That was not all he talked about. He talked about Earth. He told us it was dead, and urged us very strongly to go to Camporion. Shall we go? It's something I've been considering, Golan, admitted Pellerat. Just leave here? We can come back after we check out the Syria sector. It doesn't occur to you that his whole purpose in seeing us was to deflect us from Seychelles and get us out of here? Get us anywhere but here? Why? I don't know. See here, they expected us to go to Trantor. That was what you wanted to do, and maybe that's what they counted on us doing. I messed things up by insisting we go to Seychelles, which is the last thing they wanted, and so now they have to get us out of here. Pellaret looked distinctly unhappy. But, Golan, you are just making statements. Why don't they want us on Seychelles? I don't know, Janoff, but it's enough for me that they want us out. I'm staying here. I'm not going to leave. But, but, look, Golan, if the Second Foundation wanted us to leave, wouldn't they just influence our minds to make us want to leave? Why bother reasoning with us? Now that you bring up the point, haven't they done that in your case, Professor? And Trevise's eyes narrowed in sudden suspicion. Don't you want to leave? Pellaret looked at Trevise in surprise. I just think there's some sense to it. Of course you would, if you've been influenced. But I haven't been. Of course you would swear you hadn't been if you had been. Pellaret said, If you box me in this way, there's no way of disproving your bare assertion. What are you going to do? I will remain in Seychelles, and you'll stay here too. You can't navigate the ship without me, so if Kampor has influenced you, he has influenced the wrong one. Very well, Golan. We'll stay in Seychelles until we have independent reasons to leave. The worst thing we can do, after all, worse than either staying or going, is to fall out with each other. Come, old chap, if I had been influenced, would I be able to change my mind and go along with you cheerfully, as I plan to do now? Trevise thought for a moment, and then, as though with an inner shake, smiled and held out his hand. Agreed, Janoff. Now, let's get back to the ship and make another start tomorrow, if we can think of one. 47. Mundley Kampor did not remember when he had been recruited. For one thing, he had been a child at the time. For another, the agents of the Second Foundation were meticulous in removing their traces as far as that was possible. Kampor was an observer, and to a Second Foundationer, he was instantly recognizable as such. It meant that Kampor was acquainted with mentalics and could converse with Second Foundationers in their own fashion to a degree, but he was in the lowest rank of the hierarchy. He could catch glimpses of minds, but he could not adjust them. The education he had received had never gone that far. He was an observer, not a doer. It made him second class at best, but he did not mind much. He knew his importance in the scheme of things. During the early centuries of the Second Foundation, it had underestimated the task before it. It had imagined that its handful of members could monitor the entire galaxy, and that Selden's plan to be maintained would require only the most occasional, the lightest touch here and there. The mule had stripped them of these delusions. Coming from nowhere, he had caught the second foundation, and of course the first, though that didn't matter, utterly by surprise, and had left them helpless. It took five years before a counterattack could be organized, and then only at the cost of a number of lives. With Palver, a full recovery was made, again at a distressing cost, and he finally took the appropriate measures. The operations of the second foundation, he decided, must be enormously expanded, without at the same time increasing the chances of detection unduly, so he instituted the Corps of Observers. Kampor did not know how many observers were in the galaxy, or even how many there were on Terminus. It was not his business to know. Ideally, there should be no detectable connection between any two observers, so that the loss of one would not entail the loss of any other. All connections were with the upper echelons on Trantor. It was Kampor's ambition to go to Trantor some day. Though he thought it extremely unlikely, he knew that occasionally an observer might be brought to Trantor and promoted, but that was rare. The qualities that made for a good observer were not those that pointed toward the table. There was Jendabal, for instance, who was four years younger than Kampor. 
He must have been recruited as a boy, just as Kampor was, but he had been taken directly to Trantor and was now a speaker. Kampor had no illusions as to why that should be. He had been much in contact with Jendabal of late, and he had experienced the power of that young man's mind. He could not have stood up against it for a second. Kampor was not often conscious of a lowly status. There was almost never occasion to consider it. After all, as in the case of other observers, he imagined, it was only lowly by the standards of Trantor. On their own non-Trantorian worlds, in their own non-mentalic societies, it was easy for observers to obtain high status. Kampor, for instance, had never had trouble getting into good schools or finding good company. He had been able to use his mentalics in a simple way to enhance his natural intuitive ability. That natural ability had been why he had been recruited in the first place, he was sure, and in this way to prove himself a star at hyperspatial pursuit. He became a hero at college, and this set his foot on the first rung of a political career. Once this present crisis was over, there was no telling how much farther he might advance. If the crisis resolved itself successfully, as surely it would, would it not be recalled that it was Kampor who had first noted Treviz, not as a human being, anyone could have done that, but as a mind. He had encountered Treviz in college, and had seen him at first only as a jovial and quick-witted companion. One morning, however, he had stirred sluggishly out of slumber, and in the stream of consciousness that accompanied the never-never land of half-sleep, he felt what a pity it was that Treviz had never been recruited. Treviz couldn't have been recruited, of course, since he was Terminus-born, and not, like Kampor, a native of another world. And even with that aside, it was too late. Only the quite young are plastic enough to receive an education into mentalics. The painful introduction of that art, it was more than a science, into adult brains set rustily in their mold, was a thing of the first two generations after Selden only. But then, if Treviz had been ineligible for recruiting in the first place, and had outlived the possibility in the second... What had roused Kampor's concern over the matter? On their next meeting, Kampor had penetrated Treviz's mind deeply and discovered what it was that must have initially disturbed him. Treviz's mind had characteristics that did not fit the rules he had been taught. Over and over it eluded him. As he followed its workings, he found gaps. No, they couldn't be actual gaps, actual leaps of non-existence. They were places where Treviz's manner of mind dove too deeply to be followed. Kampor had no way of determining what this meant, but he watched Treviz's behavior in the light of what he had discovered, and he began to suspect that Treviz had an uncanny ability to reach right conclusions from what would seem to be insufficient data. Did this have something to do with the gaps? Surely this was a matter for mentalism beyond his own powers, for the table itself, perhaps. He had the uneasy feeling that Treviz's powers of decision were unknown in their full to the man himself, and that he might be able to... To do what? Kampor's knowledge did not suffice. He could almost see the meaning of what Treviz possessed, but not quite. There was only the intuitive conclusion, or perhaps just a guess, that Treviz might be potentially a person of the utmost importance. He had to take the chance that this might be so, and to risk seeming to be less than qualified for his post. After all, if he were correct, he was not sure, looking back on it, how he had managed to find the courage to continue his efforts. He could not penetrate the administrative barriers that ringed the table. He had all but reconciled himself to a broken reputation. He had worked himself down, despairingly, to the most junior member of the table. And finally, Stor Jendabal had responded to his call. Jendabal had listened patiently, and from that time on there had been a special relationship between them. It was on Jendabal's behalf that Kampor had maintained his relationship with Treviz, and on Jendabal's direction that he had carefully set up the situation that had resulted in Treviz's exile. And it was through Jendabal that Kampor might yet, he was beginning to hope, achieve his dream of promotion to Trantor. All preparations, however, had been designed to send Treviz to Trantor. Treviz's refusal to do this had taken Kampor entirely by surprise, and, Kampor thought, had been unforeseen by Jendabal as well. At any rate, Jendabal was hurrying to the spot, and to Kampor that deepened the sense of crisis. Kampor sent out his hypersignal. 48. Jendabal was roused from his sleep by the touch on his mind. It was effective and not in the least disturbing. Since it affected the arousal center directly, he simply awoke. He sat up in bed, the sheet falling from his well-shaped and smoothly muscular torso. He had recognized the touch. The differences were as distinctive to mentalists as were voices to those who communicated primarily by sound. 
Jendabal sent out the standard signal, asking if a small delay were possible, and the no-emergency call returned. Without undue haste, then, Jendabal attended to the morning routine. He was still in the ship's shower, with the used water draining into the recycling mechanisms when he made contact again. Compor? Yes, Speaker. Have you spoken with Trevise and the other one? Pellerat. Yanov Pellerat. Yes, Speaker. Good. Give me another five minutes and I'll arrange visuals. He passed Suranovi on his way to the controls. She looked at him questioningly and made as though to speak, but he placed a finger on his lips and she subsided at once. Jendabal still felt a bit uncomfortable at the intensity of adoration respect in her mind, but it was coming to be a comfortingly normal part of his environment somehow. He had hooked a small tendril of his mind to hers, and there would now be no way to affect his mind without affecting hers. The simplicity of her mind, and there was an enormous aesthetic pleasure to be found in contemplating its unadorned symmetry, Jendabal couldn't help thinking, made it impossible for any extraneous minefield to exist in their neighborhood without detection. He felt a surge of gratitude for the courteous impulse that had moved him that moment they had stood together outside the university, and that had led her to come to him precisely when she could be most useful. He said, Kampor? Yes, Speaker? Relax, please. I must study your mind. No offense is intended. As you wish, Speaker. May I ask the purpose? To make certain you are untouched. Kampor said, I know you have political adversaries at the table, Speaker, but surely none of them... Do not speculate, Kampor. Relax. Yes, you are untouched. Now, if you will cooperate with me, we will establish visual contact. What followed was, in the ordinary sense of the word, an illusion, since no one but someone who was aided by the metallic power of a well-trained second foundationer would have been able to detect anything at all, either by the senses or by any physical detecting device. It was the building up of a face and its appearance from the contours of a mind, and even the best mentalist could succeed in producing only a shadowy and somewhat uncertain figure. Kampor's face was there in mid-space, as though it were seen through a thin but shifting curtain of gauze, and Jendabal knew that his own face appeared in an identical manner in front of Kampor. By physical hyperwave, communication could have been established through images so clear that speakers who were a thousand parsecs apart might judge themselves to be face to face. Jendabal's ship was equipped for the purpose. There were, however, advantages to the mentalist vision. The chief was that it could not be tapped by any device known to the first foundation. Nor, for that matter, could one second foundationer tap the mentalist vision of another, the play of mind might be followed, but not the delicate change of facial expression that gave the communication its finer points. As for the anti-mules, well, the purity of Novi's mind was sufficient to assure him that none were about. He said, Tell me precisely, Kampor, the talk you had with Trevise and with this Pellerat, precisely to the level of mind. Of course, Speaker, said Kampor. It didn't take long. The combination of sound, expression, and mentalism compressed matters considerably, despite the fact that there was far more to tell at the level of mind than if there had been a mere parroting of speech. Jendabal watched intently. There was little redundancy, if any, in mentalist vision. In true vision, or even in physical hypervision across the parsecs, one saw enormously more in the way of information bits than was absolutely necessary for comprehension, and one could miss a great deal without losing anything significant. Through the gauze of mentalist vision, however, one bought absolute security at the price of losing the luxury of being able to miss bits. Every bit was significant. There were always horror tales that passed from instructor to student on Trantor, tales that were designed to impress on the young the importance of concentration. The most often repeated was certainly the least reliable. It told of the first report on the progress of the mule before he had taken over Kalgan of the minor official who received the report, and who had no more than the impression of a horse-like animal because he did not see or understand the small flick that signified personal name. The official therefore decided that the whole thing was too unimportant to pass on to Trentor. By the time the next message came, it was too late to take immediate action, and five more bitter years had to pass. The event had almost certainly never happened, but that didn't matter. It was a dramatic story, and it served to motivate every student into the habit of intent concentration. Jendabal remembered his own student days when he made an error in reception that seemed in his own mind to be both insignificant and understandable. His teacher, old Kendast, a tyrant to the roots of his cerebellum, had simply sneered and said, A horse-like animal, Cub Jendabal? And that had been enough to make him collapse in shame. Kampor finished. Jendabal said, 
Your estimate, please, of Treviso's reaction. You know him better than I do, better than anyone does. Comfort said, It was clear enough. The mentalic indications were unmistakable. He thinks my words and actions represent my extreme anxiety to have him go to Trentor or to the Sirius sector or to any place but where, in fact, he is actually going. It meant, in my opinion, that he would remain firmly where he was. The fact that I attached great importance to his shifting his position, in short, forced him to give it the same importance, and since he feels his own interest to be diametrically opposed to mine, he will deliberately act against what he interprets to be my wish. You are certain of that? Quite certain. Genderball considered this and decided that Campo was correct. He said, I am satisfied. You have done well. Your tale of Earth's radioactive destruction was cleverly chosen to help produce the proper reaction without the need for direct manipulation of the mind. Commendable. Campor seemed to struggle with himself a short moment. Speaker, he said, I cannot accept your praise. I did not invent the tale. It is true. There really is a planet called Earth in the Syria sector, and it really is considered to be the original home of humanity. It was radioactive, either to begin with or eventually, and this grew worse till the planet died. There was indeed a mind-enhancing invention that came to nothing. All this is considered history on the home planet of my ancestors. So, interesting, said Genderball with no obvious conviction. And better yet, to know when a truth will do is admirable, since no non-truth can be presented with the same sincerity. Palver once said, The closer to the truth, the better the lie, and the truth itself, when it can be used, is the best lie. Campor said, There is one thing more to say. In following instructions to keep Trevise in the Seychelles sector until you arrived, and to do so at all costs, I had to go so far in my efforts that it is clear that he suspects me of being under the influence of the Second Foundation. Gendable nodded. That, I think, is unavoidable under the circumstances. His monomania on the subject would be sufficient to have him see Second Foundation, even where it was not. We must simply take that into account. Speaker, if it is absolutely necessary that Trevise stay where he is until you can reach him, it would simplify matters if I came to meet you, took you aboard my ship, and brought you back. It will take less than a day. No, observer, said Gendable sharply. You will not do this. The people on Terminus know where you are. You have a hyper-relay on your ship which you cannot remove, have you not? Yes, Speaker. And if Terminus knows you have landed on Seychelles, their ambassador on Seychelles knows of it, and the ambassador knows also that Trevise has landed. Your hyper-relay will tell Terminus that you have left for a specific point hundreds of parsecs away and returned, and the ambassador will inform them that Trevise has, however, remained in the sector. From this, how much will the people at Terminus guess? The mayor of Terminus is, by all accounts, a shrewd woman, and the last thing we want to do is to alarm her by presenting her with an obscure puzzle. We don't want her to lead a section of her fleet here. The chances of that are, in any case, uncomfortably high. Campor said, With respect, Speaker, what reason do we have to fear a fleet if we can control a commander? However little reason there might be, there is still less reason to fear if the fleet is not here. You stay where you are, observer. When I reach you, I will join you on your ship. And then? And then, Speaker? Why... And then I will take over. 49. Gendable sat in place after he dismantled the Ventilist vision and stayed there for long minutes, considering. During this long trip to Seychelles, unavoidably long in this ship of his, which could in no way match the technological advancement of the products of the First Foundation, he had gone over every single report on Trevise. The reports had stretched over nearly a decade. Seen as a whole, and in the light of recent events, there was no longer any doubt Trevise would have been a marvelous recruit for the Second Foundation, if the policy of never touching the Terminus Bourne had not been in place since Palver's time. There was no telling how many recruits of highest quality had been lost to the Second Foundation over the centuries. There was no way of evaluating every one of the quadrillions of human beings populating the galaxy. None of them was likely to have had more promise than Trevise, however, and certainly none could have been in a more sensitive spot. Gendabal shook his head slightly. Trevise should never have been overlooked, terminus born or not, and credit to Observer Campor for seeing it, even after the years it distorted him. Trevise was of no use to them now. Of course, he was too old for the molding, but he still had that inborn intuition, that ability to guess a solution on the basis of totally inadequate information, and something, something... Old Chandis, who, despite being past his prime, was first speaker and had on the whole been a good one, saw something there, even without the correlated data and the reasoning that Gendabal had worked out in the course of this trip. Trevise, Chandis had thought, was the key to the crisis. 
Why was Treviz here at Seychelles? What was he planning? What was he doing? And he couldn't be touched. Of that, Gendebal was sure. Until it was known precisely what Treviz's role was, it would be totally wrong to try to modify him in any way. With the anti-mules, whoever they were, whatever they might be in the field, a wrong move with respect to Treviz, Treviz above all, might explode a wholly unexpected microsun in their faces. He felt a mind hovering about his own, and absently brushed at it, as he might at one of the more annoying Trantorian insects, though with mind rather than hand. He felt the instant wash of other pain, and looked up. Soranovi had her palm to her furrowed brow. Your pardon, master. I be struck with sudden head anguish. Gendebal was instantly contrite. I'm sorry, Novi. I wasn't thinking, or I was thinking too intently. Instantly and gently, he smoothed the ruffled mind tendrils. Novi smiled with sudden brightness. It passed with sudden vanishing. That kind sound of your words, master, works well upon me. Gendebal said, Good. Is something wrong? Why are you here? He forbore to enter her mind in greater detail in order to find out for himself. More and more he felt a reluctance to invade her privacy. Novi hesitated. She leaned toward him slightly. I be concerned. You are looking at nothing and making sounds, and your face was twitching. I stayed there, stick frozen, afeard you were declining, ill, and unknowing what to do. It was nothing, Novi. You are not to fear. He patted her nearer hand. There is nothing to fear. Do you understand? Fear, or any strong emotion, twisted and spoiled the symmetry of her mind somewhat. He preferred it calm and peaceful and happy, but he hesitated at the thought of adjusting it into that position by outer influence. She had felt the previous adjustment to be the effect of his words, and it seemed to him that he preferred it that way. He said, Novi, why don't I call you Sura? She looked up at him in sudden woe. Oh, master, do not do so. But Rufiran did so on that day that we met. I know you well enough now. I know well he did so, master. It be how a man speak to a girl who have no man, no betrothed, who is not complete. You say her previous. It is more honorable for me if you say Novi, and I be proud that you say so. And if I have not man now, I have master, and I be pleased. I hope it be not offensive to you to say Novi. What certainly isn't Novi. And her mind was beautifully smooth at that, and Gendebal was pleased. Too pleased. Ought he to be so pleased? A little shamefacedly, he remembered that the mule was supposed to have been affected in this manner by that woman of the first foundation, Beta Darrell, to his own undoing. This, of course, was different. This Hamish woman was his defense against alien minds, and he wanted her to serve that purpose most efficiently. No, that was not true. His function as a speaker would be compromised if he ceased to understand his own mind, or worse, if he deliberately misconstrued it to avoid the truth. The truth was that it pleased him when she was calm and peaceful and happy endogenously, without his interference, and that it pleased him simply because she pleased him, and, he thought defiantly, there was nothing wrong with that. He said, Sit down, Novi. She did so, balancing herself precariously at the edge of the chair and sitting as far away as the confines of the room allowed. Her mind was flooded with respect. He said, When you saw me making sounds, Novi, I was speaking at a long distance, scholar fashion. Novi said sadly, her eyes cast down, I see, master, that there be much to scholar fashion I understand not and imagine not. It be difficult mountain high art. I be ashamed to have come to you to be made scholar. How is it, master, you did not be laugh me? Chendabal said, It is no shame to aspire to something, even if it is beyond your reach. You are now too old to be made a scholar after my fashion, but you are never too old to learn more than you already know and to become able to do more than you already can. I will teach you something about this ship. By the time we reach our destination, you will know quite a bit about it. He felt delighted. Why not? He was deliberately turning his back on the stereotype of the Hamish people. What right in any case had the heterogeneous group of the Second Foundation to set up such a stereotype? The young produced by them were only occasionally suited to become high-level Second Foundationers themselves. The children of speakers almost never qualified to be speakers. There were the three generations of Lingusters three centuries ago, but there was always the suspicion that the middle speaker of that series did not really belong. And, if that were true, who were the people of the university to place themselves on so high a pedestal? He watched Novi's eyes glisten, and was pleased that they did. She said, I try hard to learn all you teach me, master. I'm sure you will, he said, and then hesitated. It occurred to him that in his conversation with Kampor, he had in no way indicated at any time that he was not alone. There was no hint of a companion. A woman could be taken for granted, perhaps. At least Kampor would no doubt not be surprised. But a Hamish woman? 
For a moment, despite anything Jandabal could do, the stereotype reigned supreme, and he found himself glad that Kampor had never been on Trantor and would not recognize Novi as a Hamish woman. He shook it off. It didn't matter if Kampor knew or knew not, or if anyone did. Jandabal was a speaker of the Second Foundation, and he could do as he pleased within the constraints of the Zeldon plan, and no one could interfere. Novi said, Master, once we reach our destination, will we part? He looked at her and said, with perhaps more force than he intended, We will not be separated, Novi. And the Hamish woman smiled shyly and looked for all the galaxy as though she might have been any woman. Chapter 13 University 50. Pellerat wrinkled his nose when he and Treviz re-entered the far star. Treviz shrugged. The human body is a powerful dispenser of odors. Recycling never works instantaneously, and artificial scents merely overlay. They do not replace. And I suppose no two ships smell quite alike once they've been occupied for a period of time by different people. That's right. But did you smell Seychelles Planet after the first hour? No, admitted Pellerat. Well, you won't smell this after a while either. In fact, if you live in the ship long enough, you'll welcome the odor that greets you on your return as signifying home. And by the way, if you become a galactic rover after this, Janoff, you'll have to learn that it is impolite to comment on the odor of any ship, or for that matter, any world, to those who live on that ship or world. Between us, of course, it's all right. As a matter of fact, Golan, the funny thing is I do consider the Far Star home, at least its foundation made. Pellerat smiled. You know, I never considered myself a patriot. I like to think I recognize only humanity as my nation, but I must say that being away from the foundation fills my heart with love for it. Trebiz was making his bed. You're not very far from the foundation, you know. The Seychelles Union is almost surrounded by Federation territory. We have an ambassador and an enormous presence here, from consuls on down. The Seychellians like to oppose us in words, but they are usually very cautious about doing anything that gives us displeasure. Genoff, do turn in. We got nowhere today, and we have to do better tomorrow. Still, there was no difficulty in hearing between the two rooms, however, and when the ship was dark, Pellerat, tossing restlessly, finally said in a not very loud voice, Golan? Yes? You're not sleeping? Not while you're talking. We did get somewhere today. Your friend Kampor... Ex-friend, growled Trevise. Whatever his status, he talked about Earth and told us something I hadn't come across in my researches before. Radioactivity. Trevise lifted himself to one elbow. Look, Golan, if Earth is really dead, that doesn't mean we return home. I still want to find Gaia. Pellerat made a puffing noise with his mouth as though he were blowing away feathers. My dear chap, of course, so do I. Nor do I think Earth is dead. Kampor may have been telling what he felt was the truth, but there's scarcely a sector in the galaxy that doesn't have some tale or other that would place the origin of humanity on some local world, and they almost invariably call it Earth or some closely equivalent name. We call it globocentrism in anthropology. People have a tendency to take it for granted that they are better than their neighbors, that their culture is older and superior to that of other worlds, that what is good in other worlds has been borrowed from them, while what is bad is distorted or perverted in the borrowing or invented elsewhere. And the tendency is to equate superiority in quality with superiority in duration. If they cannot reasonably maintain their own planet to be Earth or its equivalent and the beginnings of the human species... They almost always do the best they can by placing Earth in their own sector, even when they cannot locate it exactly. Trevise said, And you're telling me that Kampor was just following the common habit when he said Earth existed in the Syria sector? Still, the Syria sector does have a long history, so every world in it should be well known, and it should be easy to check the matter even without going there. Pellerat chuckled. Even if you were to show that no world in the Syria sector could possibly be Earth, that wouldn't help... You underestimate the depths to which mysticism can vary rationality, Golan. There are at least half a dozen sectors in the galaxy where respectable scholars repeat with every appearance of solemnity and with no trace of a smile local tales that Earth, or whatever they choose to call it, is located in hyperspace and cannot be reached except by accident. And do they say anyone has ever reached it by accident? There are always tales, and there was always a patriotic refusal to disbelieve, even though the tales are never in the least credible, and are never believed by anyone not of the world that produces them. Then, Genov, let's not believe them ourselves. Let's enter our own private hyperspace of sleep. But, Colin, it's this business of Earth's radioactivity that interests me. 
To me, that seems to bear the mark of truth, or a kind of truth. What do you mean, a kind of truth? Well, a world that is radioactive would be a world in which hard radiation would be present in higher concentration than is usual. The rate of mutation would be higher on such a world, and evolution would proceed more quickly and more diversely. I told you, if you remember, that among the points on which almost all the tales agree is that life on Earth was incredibly diverse, millions of species and all kinds of life. It is this diversity of life, this explosive development, that might have brought intelligence to the Earth, and then the surge outward into the galaxy. If Earth were for some reason radioactive, that is, more radioactive than other planets, that might account for everything else about Earth that is, or was, unique. Trevise was silent for a moment. Then, in the first place, we have no reason to believe Kampor was telling the truth. He may well have been lying freely in order to induce us to leave this place and go chasing madly off to Sirius. I believe that's exactly what he was doing. And even if he were telling the truth, what he said was that there was so much radioactivity that life became impossible. Pellerat made the blowing gesture again. There wasn't too much radioactivity to allow life to develop on Earth, and it is easier for life to maintain itself once established than to develop in the first place. Granted, then, that life was established and maintained on Earth. Therefore, the level of radioactivity could not have been incompatible with life to begin with, and it can only have fallen off with time. There is nothing that can raise the level. Nuclear explosions, suggested Trevise. What would that have to do with it? I mean, suppose nuclear explosions took place on Earth. On Earth's surface? Impossible. There's no record in the history of the galaxy of any society being so foolish as to use nuclear explosions as a weapon of war. We would never have survived. During the Trigellian insurrections, when both sides were reduced to starvation and desperation, and when Gendiporus Korat suggested the initiation of a fusion reaction in... He was hanged by the sailors of his own fleet. I know galactic history. I was thinking of accident. There's no record of accidents of that sort that are capable of significantly raising the intensity of radioactivity of a planet generally. He sighed. I suppose that when we get around to it, we'll have to go to the Sirius sector and do a little prospecting there. Someday, perhaps, we will. But for now, yes, yes, I'll stop talking. He did. And Trevise lay in the dark for nearly an hour, considering whether he had attracted too much attention already, and whether it might not be wise to go to the Sirius sector and then return to Gaia when attention, everyone's attention, was elsewhere. He had arrived at no clear decision by the time he fell asleep. His dreams were troubled. 51. They did not arrive back in the city till mid-morning. The tourist center was quite crowded this time, but they managed to obtain the necessary directions to a reference library where in turn they received instruction in the use of the local models of data-gathering computers. They went carefully through the museums and universities, beginning with those that were nearest, and checked out whatever information was available on anthropologists, archaeologists, and ancient historians. Pellaret said, Ah! Ah, said Trevise with some asperity. Ah, what? This name Quintessets. It seems familiar. You know him? No, of course not but I may have read papers of his back at the ship where I had my reference collection. We're not going back, Genoff. If the name is familiar, that's a starting point. If he can't help us, he will undoubtedly be able to direct us further. He rose to his feet. Let's find a way of getting to Seychelles University, and since there will be nobody there at lunchtime, let's eat first. It was not until late afternoon that they had made their way out to the university, worked their way through its maze, and found themselves in an anteroom waiting for a young woman who had gone off in search of information, and who might, or might not, lead them to quintessets. I wonder, said Pallarat uneasily, how much longer we'll have to wait. It must be getting toward the close of the school day. And, as though that were a cue, the young lady whom they had last seen half an hour before walked rapidly toward them, her shoes glinting red and violet, and striking the ground with a sharp musical tone as she walked. The pitch varied with the speed and force of her steps. Pellaret winced. He supposed that each world had its own ways of assaulting the senses, just as each had its own smell. He wondered if, now that he no longer noticed the smell, he might also learn not to notice the cacophony of fashionable young women when they walked. She came to Pellaret and stopped. May I have your full name, Professor? It's Janoff Pellerat, miss. Your home planet? 
Trevise began to lift one hand as though to enjoin silence, but Pellerat, either not seeing or not regarding, said, Terminus. The young woman smiled broadly and looked pleased. When I told Professor Quintessetz that a Professor Pellerat was inquiring for him, he said he would see you if you were Janoff Pellerat of Terminus, but not otherwise. Pellerat blinked rapidly. You, you mean he's heard of me? It certainly seems so. And almost creakily, Pellerat managed to smile as he turned to Trevise. He's heard of me. I honestly didn't think... I mean, I've written very few papers, and I didn't think that anyone... He shook his head. They weren't really important. Well, then, said Trevise, smiling himself, stop hugging yourself in an ecstasy of self-underestimation and let's go. He turned to the woman. I presume, miss, there's some sort of transportation to take us to him? It's within walking distance. You won't even have to leave the building complex, and I'll be glad to take you there. Are both of you from Terminus? And off she went. The two men followed, and Trevise said with a trace of annoyance, Yes, we are. Does that make a difference? Oh, no, of course not. There are people on Seychelles that don't like foundation, as you know, but here at the university we're more cosmopolitan than that. Live and let live is what I always say. I mean, foundationers are people, too. You know what I mean? Yes, I know what you mean. Lots of us say that Seychellians are people. That's just the way it should be. I've never seen Terminus. It must be a big city. Actually, it isn't, said Trevise, matter-of-factly. I suspect it's smaller than Seychelles City. You're tweaking my fingers, she said. It's the capital of the Foundation Federation, isn't it? I mean, there isn't another terminus, is there? No, there's only one terminus, as far as I know, and that's where we're from, the capital of the Foundation Federation. Well, then, it must be an enormous city, and you're coming all the way here to see the professor? We're very proud of him, you know. He's considered the biggest authority in the whole galaxy. Really? said Trevise. On what? Her eyes opened wide again. You are a teaser. He knows more about ancient history than than I know about my own family. And she continued to walk on ahead on her musical feet. One can only be called a teaser and a finger tweaker so often without developing an actual impulse in that direction. Trevise smiled and said, The professor knows all about Earth, I suppose. Earth? She stopped at an office door and looked at them blankly. You know, the world where humanity got its start. Oh, you mean the planet that was first? I guess so. I guess he should know all about it. After all, it's located in the Seychelles sector. Everyone knows that. This is his office. Let me signal him. Oh, no, don't, said Trevise. Not for just a minute. Tell me about Earth. Actually, I never heard anyone call it Earth. I suppose that's a foundation word. We call it Gaia here. Trevise cast a swift look at Pellerette. Oh, and where is it located? Nowhere. It's in hyperspace, and there's no way anyone can get to it. When I was a little girl, my grandmother said that Gaia was once in real space, but it was so disgusted at the crimes and stupidities of human beings, muttered Pellerette, that out of shame it left space and refused to have anything more to do with the human beings it had sent out into the galaxy. You know the story, then. See? A girlfriend of mine says it's superstition. Well, I'll tell her. If it's good enough for professors from the Foundation... A glittering section of lettering on the smoky glass of the door read, Sotain Quintessets Ept, in the hard-to-read Seychellian calligraphy, and under it was printed in the same fashion, Department of Ancient History. The woman placed her finger on a smooth metal circle. There was no sound, but the smokiness of the glass turned a milky white for a moment, and a soft voice said in an abstracted way, Identify yourself, please. Janoff Pellerat of Terminus, said Pellerat, with Golan Trevise of the same world, the door swung open at once. 52. The man who stood up, walked around his desk, and advanced to meet them was tall and well into middle age. He was light brown in skin color, and his hair, which was set in crisp curls over his head, was iron gray. He held out his hand in greeting, and his voice was soft and low. I am S.Q. I am delighted to meet you, professors. Trevise said, I don't own an academic title. I merely accompany Professor Pellerat. You may call me simply Trevise. I am pleased to meet you, Professor Abt. Quintessets held up one hand in clear embarrassment. Oh, no. Abt is merely a foolish title of some sort that has no significance outside of Seychelles. Ignore it, please, and call me SQ. We tend to use initials in ordinary social intercourse on Seychelles. I'm so pleased to meet two of you, when I had been expecting but one. He seemed to hesitate a moment, then extended his right hand, after wiping it unobtrusively on his trousers. Trevise took it, wondering what the proper Seychellian manner of greeting was. Quintessette said, Please sit down. 
I'm afraid you'll find these chairs to be lifeless ones, but I, for one, don't want my chairs to hug me. It's all the fashion for chairs to hug you nowadays, but I prefer a hug to mean something, eh? Trevise smiled and said, Who would not? Your name, S.Q., seems to be of the Rim Worlds and not Seychellian. I apologize if the remark is impertinent. I don't mind. My family traces back in part to Ascon. Five generations back, my great-great-grandparents left Ascon when foundation domination grew too heavy. Pellaret said, And we are foundationers. Our apologies. Quintessets waved his hand genially. I don't hold a grudge across a stretch of five generations. Not that such things haven't been done, more's the pity. Would you like to have something to eat, to drink? Would you like music in the background? If you don't mind, said Pellaret, I'd be willing to get right to business if Seychellian ways would permit. Seychellian ways are not a barrier to that, I assure you. You have no idea how remarkable this is, Dr. Pellaret. It was only about two weeks ago that I came across your article on origin myths in the Archaeological Review, and it struck me as a remarkable synthesis, all too brief. Pellaret flushed with pleasure. How delighted I am that you have read it. I had to condense it, of course, since the review would not print a full study. I have been planning to do a treatise on the subject. I wish you would. In any case, as soon as I had read it, I had this desire to see you. I even had the notion of visiting Terminus in order to do so, though that would have been hard to arrange. Why so? asked Trevise. Quintessets looked embarrassed. I'm sorry to say that Seychelles is not eager to join the Foundation Federation, and rather discourages any social communication with the Foundation. We've a tradition of neutralism, you see. Even the mule didn't bother us except to extort from us a specific statement of neutrality. For that reason, any application for permission to visit Foundation territory generally, and particularly Terminus, is viewed with suspicion, although a scholar such as myself, intent on academic business, would probably obtain his passport in the end. But none of that was necessary. You have come to me. I can scarcely believe it. I ask myself, why? Have you heard of me as I have heard of you? Pellaret said, I know your work, S.Q., and in my records I have abstracts of your papers. It is why I have come to you. I am exploring both the matter of Earth, which is the reputed planet of origin of the human species, and the early period of the exploration and settlement of the galaxy. In particular, I have come here to inquire as to the founding of Seychelles. From your paper, said Quintessets, I presume you are interested in myths and legends. Even more in history, actual facts, if such exist. Myths and legends otherwise. Quintessets rose and walked rapidly back and forth the length of his office, paused to stare at Pellaret, then walked again. Trevise said impatiently, Well, sir? Quintessets said, Odd, really odd. It was only yesterday. Pellaret said, What was only yesterday? Quintessets said, I told you, Dr. Pellaret, may I call you J.P., by the way, I find using a full-length name rather unnatural. Please do. I told you, J.P., that I had admired your paper and that I had wanted to see you. The reason I wanted to see you was that you clearly had an extensive collection of legends concerning the beginnings of the world, and yet didn't have ours. In other words, I wanted to see you in order to tell you precisely what you have come to see me to find out. What is this to do with yesterday, ask you, asked Ravis. We have legends, a legend, an important one to our society, for it has become our central mystery. Mystery, said Trevise. I don't mean a puzzle or anything of that sort. That, I believe, would be the usual meaning of the word in galactic standard. There's a specialized meaning here. It means something secret, something only certain adepts know the full meaning of, something not to be spoken of to outsiders, and yesterday was the day. The day of what, S.Q., asked Trevise, slightly exaggerating his air of patience. Yesterday was the day of flight. Ah, said Trevise, a day of meditation and quiet when everyone is supposed to remain at home. Something like that, in theory, except that in the larger cities, the more sophisticated regions, there is little observance in the older fashion, but you know about it, I see. Pellaret, who had grown uneasy at Trevise's annoyed tone, put in hastily, We heard a little of it, of having arrived yesterday. Of all days, said Trevise sarcastically. See here, S.Q., as I said, I'm not an academic, but I have a question. You said you were speaking of a central mystery, meaning it was not to be spoken of to outsiders. Why, then, are you speaking of it to us? We are outsiders. So you are. 
but I'm not an observer of the day, and the depth of my superstition in this matter is slight at best. J.P.'s paper, however, reinforced a feeling I have had for a long time. A myth or legend is simply not made up out of a vacuum. Nothing is or can be. Somehow there is a kernel of truth behind it, however distorted that might be, and I would like the truth behind our legend of the day of flight. Tavis said, Is it safe to talk about it? Quintessette shrugged. Not entirely, I suppose. The conservative elements among our population would be horrified. However, they don't control the government, and haven't for a century. The secularists are strong, and would be stronger still, if the conservatives didn't take advantage of our, if you'll excuse me, anti-foundation bias. Then, too, since I am discussing the matter out of my scholarly interest in ancient history, the League of Accommodations will support me strongly in case of need. In that case, said Pellaret, would you tell us about your central mystery, S.Q.? Yes, but let me make sure we won't be interrupted, or, for that matter, overheard. Even if one must stare the bull in the face, one needn't slap its muzzle, as the saying goes. He flicked a pattern on the work face of an instrument on his desk and said, We are incommunicado now. Are you sure you're not bugged, said Trevise? Bugged. Uh, tapped. Eavesdropped. Subjected to a device that will have you under observation, visual or auditory or both. Quintessets looked shocked. Not here on Seychelles. Trevise shrugged. If you say so. Please go on, S.Q., said Pellerin. Quintessets pursed his lips, leaned back in his chair, which gave slightly under the pressure, and put the tips of his fingers together. He seemed to be speculating as to just how to begin. He said, Do you know what a robot is? A robot, said Pellerat. No. Quintessets looked in the direction of Trevise, who shook his head slowly. You know what a computer is, however. Of course, said Trevise impatiently. Well, then, a mobile computerized tool is a mobile computerized tool. Trevise was still impatient. There are endless varieties, and I don't know of any generalized term for it except mobile computerized tool. That looks exactly like a human being is a robot. S.Q. completed his definition with equanimity. The distinction of a robot is that it is humaniform. Why humaniform? asked Pellerat in honest amazement. I'm not sure. It's a remarkably inefficient form for a tool, I grant you, but I'm just repeating the legend. Robot is an old word from no recognizable language, though our scholars say it bears the connotation of work. I can't think of any word, said Trevise skeptically, that sounds even vaguely like robot and that has any connection with work. Nothing in galactic, certainly, said Quintessets, but that's what they say. Pellaret said, it may have been reversed etymology. These objects were used for work, and so the word was said to mean work. In any case, why do you tell us this? Because it is a firmly fixed tradition here on Seychelles that when Earth was a single world and the galaxy lay all uninhabited before it, robots were invented and devised. There were then two sorts of human beings, natural and invented, flesh and metal, biological and mechanical, complex and simple. Quintessets came to a halt and said with a rueful laugh, I'm sorry, it is impossible to talk about robots without quoting from the Book of Flight. The people of Earth devised robots, and I need say no more. That's plain enough. And why did they devise robots? asked Trevise. Quintessets shrugged. Who can tell at this distance in time? Perhaps they were few in numbers and needed help, particularly in the great task of exploring and populating the galaxy. Trevise said, that's a reasonable suggestion. Once the galaxy was colonized, the robots would no longer be needed. Certainly there are no humanoid mobile computerized tools in the galaxy today. In any case, said Quintessette, the story is as follows, if I may vastly simplify and leave out many poetic ornamentations which, frankly, I don't accept, though the general population does or pretends to. Around Earth, there grew up colony worlds circling neighboring stars, and these colony worlds were far richer in robots than was Earth itself. There was more use for robots on raw new worlds. Earth, in fact, retreated, wished no more robots, and rebelled against them. What happened, asked Pellaret. The outer worlds were the stronger. With the help of their robots, the children defeated and controlled Earth, the mother. Pardon me, but I can't help slipping into quotation. But there were those from Earth who fled their world with better ships and stronger modes of hyperspatial travel. They fled to far distant stars and worlds, far beyond the closer worlds earlier colonized. New colonies were founded, without robots, in which human beings could live freely. 
Those were the times of flight, so-called, and the day upon which the first Earthman reached the Seychelles sector, this very planet, in fact, is the day of flight, celebrated annually for many thousands of years. Tellerat said, My dear chap, what you are saying, then, is that Seychelles was founded directly from Earth. Quintessets thought and hesitated for a moment. Then he said, That is the official belief. Obviously, said Trevise, you don't accept it. It seems to me, Quintessets began, and then burst out, Oh, great stars and small planets, I don't. It is entirely too unlikely. But it's official dogma, and however secularized the government has become, lip service to that at least is essential. Still, to the point. In your article, J.P., there is no indication that you're aware of this story, of robots and of two waves of colonization, a lesser one with robots and a greater one without. I certainly was not, said Pellaret. I hear it now for the first time, and, my dear S.Q., I am eternally grateful to you for making this known to me. I am astonished that no hint of this has appeared in any of the writings. It shows, said Quintessets, how effective our social system is. It's our Seychellian secret, our great mystery. Perhaps, said Trevise dryly. Yet the second wave of colonization, the robotless wave, must have moved out in all directions. Why is it only on Seychelles that this great secret exists? Quintessets said, It may exist elsewhere and be just a secret. Our own conservatives believe that only Seychelles was settled from Earth and that all the rest of the galaxy was settled from Seychelles. That, of course, is probably nonsense. Pellaret said, These subsidiary puzzles can be worked out in time. Now that I have the starting point, I can seek out similar information on other worlds. What counts is that I have discovered the question to ask, and a good question is, of course, the key by which infinite answers can be educed. How fortunate that I... Trevi said, Yes, Janoff, but the good SQ has not told us the whole story, surely. What happened to the older colonies and their robots, do your traditions say? Not in detail, but in essence... Human and humanoid cannot live together, apparently. The worlds with robots died. They were not viable. And Earth? Humans left it and settled here and, presumably, though the conservatives would disagree, on other planets as well. Surely not every human being left Earth. The planet was not deserted. Presumably not. I don't know. Trevise said abruptly. Was it left radioactive? Quintessets looked astonished. Radioactive? That's what I'm asking. Not to my knowledge. I never heard of such a thing. Trevise put a knuckle to his teeth and considered. Finally, he said, S.Q., it's getting late, and we have trespassed sufficiently on your time, perhaps. Pellerat made a motion as though he were about to protest, but Trevise's hand was on the other's knee and his grip tightened, so Pellerat, looking disturbed, subsided. Quintesset said, I was delighted to be of use. You have been, and if there's anything we can do in exchange, name it. Quintessets laughed gently. If the good J.P. will be so kind as to refrain from mentioning my name in connection with any writing he does on our mystery, that will be sufficient repayment. Pellerat said eagerly, You would be able to get the credit you deserve, and perhaps be more appreciated, if you were allowed to visit Terminus and even perhaps remain there as a visiting scholar at our university for an extended period. Uh, we might arrange that. Seychelles might not like the Federation, but they might not like refusing a direct request that you be allowed to come to Terminus to attend, let us say, a colloquium on some aspect of ancient history. The Seychellian half rose. Are you saying you can pull strings to arrange that? Trevise said, Why, I hadn't thought of it, but J.P. is perfectly right. That would be feasible if we tried. And, of course, the more grateful you make us, the harder we will try. Quintessets paused, then frowned. What do you mean, sir? All you have to do is tell us about Gaia, S.Q., said Trevise. And all the light in Quintessette's face died. 53. Quintessette looked down at his desk. His hand stroked absent-mindedly at his short, tightly curled hair. Then he looked at Trevise and pursed his lips tightly. It was as though he were determined not to speak. Trevise lifted his eyebrows and waited. And finally Quintessette said in a strangled sort of way... It is getting indeed late, quite glimmering. Until then he had spoken in good galactic, but now his words took on a strange shape, as though the Seychellian mode of speech were pushing past his classical education. Glimmering, S.Q.? It is nearly full night. Trevise nodded. I am thoughtless, and I am hungry, too. Could you please join us for an evening meal, S.Q., at our expense? 
we could then perhaps continue our discussion about Gaia. Quintessets rose heavily to his feet. He was taller than either of the two men from Terminus, but he was older and pudgier, and his height did not lend him the appearance of strength. He seemed more weary than when they had arrived. He blinked at them and said, I forget my hospitality. You are outworlders, and it would not be fitting that you entertain me. Come to my home. It is on campus and not far, and if you wish to carry on a conversation, I can do so in a more relaxed manner there than here. My only regret, he seemed a little uneasy, is that I can offer you only a limited meal. My wife and I are vegetarians, and if you are meat-eating, I can only express my apologies and regrets. Trevis said, J.P. and I will be quite content to forego our carnivorous natures for one meal. Your conversation will more than make up for it, I hope. I can promise you an interesting meal, whatever the conversation, said Quintessets, if your taste should run to our Seychellian spices. My wife and I have made a rare study of such things. I look forward to any exoticism you choose to supply, S.Q., said Trevise coolly, though Pellerat looked a little nervous at the prospect. Quintessets led the way. The three left the room and walked down an apparently endless corridor, with the Seychellian greeting students and colleagues now and then, but making no attempt to introduce his companions. Trevise was uneasily aware that others stared curiously at his sash, which happened to be one of his grey ones. A subdued colour was not something that was de rigueur in campus clothing, apparently. Finally, they stepped through the door and out into the open. It was indeed dark and a little cool with trees bulking in the distance and a rather rank stand of grass on either side of the walkway. Pellerat came to a halt, with his back to the glimmer of lights that came from the building they had just left and from the glows that lined the walks of the campus. He looked straight upward. Beautiful, he said. There is a famous phrase in a verse by one of our better poets that speaks of the speckle shine of Seychelles soaring sky. Trevise gazed appreciatively and said in a low voice, we are from Terminus, S.Q., and my friend at least has seen no other skies. On Terminus we see only the smooth, dim fog of the galaxy and a few barely visible stars. You would appreciate your own sky even more had you lived with ours. Quintessette said gravely, We appreciate it to the full, I assure you. It's not so much that we are in an uncrowded area of the galaxy, but that the distribution of stars is remarkably even. I don't think that you will find anywhere in the galaxy first magnitude stars so generally distributed, and yet not too many either. I have seen the skies of worlds that are inside the outer reaches of a globular cluster, and there you will see too many bright stars. It spoils the darkness of the night sky and reduces the splendor considerably. I quite agree with that, said Ruiz. Now I wonder, said Quintessets, if you see that almost regular pentagon of almost equally bright stars, the five sisters we call them, it's in that direction just above the line of trees. Do you see it? I see it, said Trevise. Very attractive. Yes, said Quintessets. It's supposed to symbolize success in love, and there's no love letter that doesn't end in a pentagon of dots to indicate a desire to make love. Each of the five stars stands for a different stage in the process, and there are famous poems which have vied with each other in making each stage as explicitly erotic as possible. In my younger days, I attempted versifying on the subject myself, and I wouldn't have thought that the time would come when I would grow so indifferent to the five sisters, though I suppose it's the common fate. Do you see the dim star just about in the center of the five sisters? Yes. That said Quintessets, is supposed to represent unrequited love. There is a legend that the star was once as bright as the rest, but faded with grief. And he walked on rapidly. 54. The dinner, Trevise had been forced to admit to himself, was delightful. There was endless variety, and the spicing and dressing were subtle but effective. Trevise said, All these vegetables, which have been a pleasure to eat, by the way, are part of the galactic dietary, are they not, S.Q.? Yes, of course. I presume, though, that there are indigenous forms of life, too. Of course. Seychelles Planet was an oxygen world when the first settlers arrived, so it had to be life-bearing, and we have preserved some of the indigenous life, you may be sure. We have quite extensive natural parks in which both the flora and the fauna of old Seychelles survive. Pellerette said sadly, There you are in advance of us, S.Q. There was little land life on Terminus when human beings arrived, 
and I'm afraid that for a long time no concerted effort was made to preserve the sea life, which had produced the oxygen that made Terminus habitable. Terminus has an ecology now that is purely galactic in nature. Seychelles, said Quintessets, with a smile of modest pride, has a long and steady record of life valuing. And Trevise chose that moment to say, When we left your office, S.Q., I believe it was your intention to feed us dinner and then tell us about Gaia. Quintessets's wife, a friendly woman, plump and quite dark, who had said little during the meal, looked up in astonishment, rose, and left the room without a word. My wife, said Quintessets uneasily, is quite a conservative, I'm afraid, and is a bit uneasy at the mention of the world. Please excuse her, but why do you ask about it? Because it is important for J.P.'s work, I'm afraid. But why do you ask it of me? We were discussing Earth, robots, the founding of Seychelles. What has all this to do with what you ask? Perhaps nothing. And yet there are so many oddnesses about the matter. Why is your wife uneasy at the mention of Gaia? Why are you uneasy? Some talk of it easily enough. We have been told only today that Gaia is Earth itself, and that it has disappeared into hyperspace because of the evil done by human beings. A look of pain crossed Quintessence's face. Who told you that gibberish? Someone I met here at the university. That's just superstition. Then it's not part of the central dogma of your legends concerning the flight? No, of course not. It's just a fable that arose among the ordinary, uneducated people. Are you sure? asked Trevise coldly. Quintessence sat back in his chair and stared at the remnant of the meal before him. Come into the living room, he said. My wife will not allow this room to be cleared and set to rights while we are here and discussing this. Are you sure it's just a fable, repeated Travis, once they had seated themselves in another room before a window that bellied upward and inward to give a clear view of Seychelles' remarkable night sky. The lights within the room glimmered down to avoid competition, and Quintessence's dark countenance melted into the shadow. Quintessence said, Aren't you sure? Do you think that any world can dissolve into hyperspace? You must understand that the average person has only the vaguest notion of what hyperspace is. The truth is, said Ravis, that I myself have only the vaguest notion of what hyperspace is, and I've been through it hundreds of times. Let me speak realities, then. I assure you that Earth, wherever it is, is not located within the borders of the Seychelles Union, and that the world you mentioned is not Earth. But even if you don't know where Earth is, S.Q., you ought to know where the world I mentioned is. It is certainly within the borders of the Seychelles Union. We know that much, eh, Pellorette? Pellorette, who had been listening stolidly, started at being suddenly addressed and said, If it comes to that, Golan, I know where it is. Trevise turned to look at him. Since when, Janoff? Since earlier this evening, my dear Golan. You showed us the five sisters, S.Q., on our way from your office to your house. You pointed out a dim star at the center of the Pentagon. I'm positive that's Gaia. Quintessence hesitated. His face, hidden in the dimness, was beyond any chance of interpretation. Finally, he said, Well, that's what our astronomers tell us, privately. It is a planet that circles that star. Trevise gazed contemplatively at Pellorette, but the expression on the professor's face was unreadable. Trevise turned to Quintessence. Then tell us about that star. Do you have its coordinates? I? No. He was almost violent in his denial. I have no stellar coordinates here. You can get it from our astronomy department, though I imagine not without trouble. No travel to that star is permitted. Why not? It's within your territory, isn't it? Spatiographically, yes. Politically, no. Trevise waited for something more to be said. When that didn't come, he rose. Professor Quintessets, he said formally, I am not a policeman, soldier, diplomat, or thug. I am not here to force information out of you. Instead, I shall, against my will, go to our ambassador... Surely you must understand that it is not I, for my own personal interest, that request this information. This is foundation business, and I don't want to make an interstellar incident out of this. I don't think the Seychelles Union would want to either. Quintessette said uncertainly, What is this foundation business? That's not something I can discuss with you. If Gaia is not something you can discuss with me, then we will transfer it all to the government level, and under the circumstances it may be the worse for Seychelles. Seychelles has kept its independence of the Federation, and I have no objection to that. I have no reason to wish Seychelles ill, and I do not wish to approach our ambassador. In fact, I will harm my own career in doing so, for I am under strict instruction to get this information without making a government matter of it. Please tell me, then, 
If there is some firm reason why you cannot discuss Gaia, will you be arrested or otherwise punished if you speak? Will you tell me plainly that I have no choice but to go to the ambassadorial height? No, no, said Quintessets, who sounded utterly confused. I know nothing about government matters. We simply don't speak of that world. Superstition? Well, yes, superstition. Skies of Seychelles, in what way am I better than that foolish person who told you that Gaia was in hyperspace, or than my wife who won't even stay in a room where Gaia is mentioned, and who may even have left the house for fear it will be smashed by lightning, by some stroke from afar? And I, even I, hesitate to pronounce the name. Gaia, Gaia, the syllables do not hurt, I am unharmed, yet I hesitate. But please, believe me when I say that I honestly don't know the coordinates for Gaia's star. I can try to help you get it, if that will help. But let me tell you that we don't discuss the world here in the Union. We keep hands and minds off it. I can tell you what little is known, really known rather than supposed, and I doubt that you can learn anything more anywhere in these worlds of the Union. We know Gaia is an ancient world, and there are some who think it is the oldest world in this sector of the galaxy, but we are not certain. Patriotism tells us Seychelles planet is the oldest. Fear tells us Gaia planet is. The only way of combining the two is to suppose that Gaia is Earth, since it is known that Seychelles was settled by Earth people. Most historians think among themselves that Gaia planet was founded independently. They think it is not a colony of any world of our Union, and that the Union was not colonized by Gaia. There is no consensus on comparative age, whether Gaia was settled before or after Seychelles was. To be said, So far, what you know is nothing, since every possible alternative is believed by someone or other. Quintessets nodded ruefully. It would seem so. It was comparatively late in our history that we became conscious of the existence of Gaia. We had been preoccupied at first in forming the Union, then in fighting off the Galactic Empire, then in trying to find our proper role as an imperial province and in limiting the power of the viceroys. It wasn't till the days of imperial weakness were far advanced that one of the later viceroys, who was under very weak central control by then, came to realize that Gaia existed and seemed to maintain its independence from the Seychellian province and even from the empire itself. It simply kept to itself in isolation and secrecy, so that virtually nothing was known about it, any more than is now known. The Viceroy decided to take it over. We have no details what happened, but his expedition was broken, and few ships returned. In those days, of course, the ships were neither very good nor very well led. Seychelles itself rejoiced at the defeat of the Viceroy, who was considered an imperial oppressor, and the debacle led almost directly to the re-establishment of our independence. The Seychelles Union snapped its ties with the Empire, and we still celebrate the anniversary of that event as Union Day. Almost out of gratitude, we left Gaia alone for nearly a century. But the time came when we were strong enough to begin to think of a little imperialistic expansion of our own. Why not take over Gaia? Why not at least establish a customs union? We sent out a fleet, and it was broken too. Thereafter, we confined ourselves to an occasional attempt at trade, attempts that were invariably unsuccessful. Gaia remained in firm isolation, and never, to anyone's knowledge, made the slightest attempt to trade or communicate with any other world. It certainly never made the slightest hostile move against anyone in any direction. And then... Quintessets turned up the light by touching a control in the arm of his chair. In the light, Quintessets's face took on a clearly sardonic expression. He went on. Since you are citizens of the Foundation, you perhaps remember the mule. Trevise flushed. In five centuries of existence, the Foundation had been conquered only once. The conquest had been only temporary and had not seriously interfered with its climb towards Second Empire. But surely no one who resented the Foundation and wished to puncture its self-satisfaction would fail to mention the mule, its one conqueror. And it was likely, thought Trevise, that Quintessets had raised the level of light in order that he might see foundational self-satisfaction punctured. He said, Yes, we of the Foundation remember the mule. The mule, said Quintessets, ruled an empire for a while, one that was as large as the Federation now controlled by the Foundation. He did not, however, rule us. He left us in peace. He passed through Seychelles at one time, however. 
We signed a declaration of neutrality and a statement of friendship. He asked nothing more. We were the only ones of whom he asked nothing more in the days before illness called a halt to his expansion and forced him to wait for death. He was not an unreasonable man, you know. He did not use unreasonable force, he was not bloody, and he ruled humanely. It was just that he was a conqueror, said Treviz sarcastically. Like the foundation, said Quintessets. Treviz, with no ready answer, said irritably, Do you have more to say about Gaia? Just a statement that the mule made. According to the account of the historic meeting between the mule and President Cayo of the Union, the mule is described as having put his signature to the document with a flourish and to have said, You are neutral even toward Gaia by this document, which is fortunate for you. Even I will not approach Gaia. Treviz shook his head. Why should he? Seychelles was eager to pledge neutrality, and Gaia had no record of ever troubling anyone. The mule was planning the conquest of the entire galaxy at the time, so why delay for trifles? Time enough to turn on Seychelles and Gaia when that was done. Perhaps, perhaps, said Quintessets. But according to one witness at the time, a person we tend to believe, the mule put down his pen as he said, Even I will not approach Gaia. His voice then dropped, and in a whisper not meant to be heard, he added, Again. Not meant to be heard, you say? Then how was it he was heard? Because his pen rolled off the table when he put it down, and a Seychellian automatically approached and bent to pick it up. His ear was close to the mule's mouth when the word again was spoken, and he heard it. He said nothing until after the mule's death. How can you prove it was not an invention? The man's life is not the kind that makes it probable he would invent something of this kind. His report is accepted. And if it is... The mule was never in or anywhere near the Seychelles Union, except on this one occasion, at least after he appeared on the galactic scene. If he had ever been on Gaia, it had to be before he appeared on the galactic scene. Well? Well, where was the mule born? I don't think anyone knows, said Treviz. In the Seychelles Union, there is a strong feeling he was born on Gaia. Because of that one word? Only partly. The mule could not be defeated because he had strange mental powers. Gaia cannot be defeated either. Gaia has not been defeated as yet. That does not necessarily prove it cannot be. Even the mule would not approach. Search the records of his overlordship. See if any region other than the Seychelles Union was so gingerly treated. And do you know that no one who has ever gone to Gaia for the purpose of peaceful trade has ever returned? Why do you suppose we know so little about it? Treviz said, Your attitude seems much like superstition. Call it what you will. Since the time of the mule, we have wiped Gaia out of our thinking. We don't want it to think of us. We only feel safe if we pretend it isn't there. It may be that the government has itself secretly initiated and encouraged the legend that Gaia has disappeared into hyperspace in the hope that people will forget that there is a real star of that name. You think that Gaia is a world of mules, then? It may be. I advise you, for your good, not to go there. If you do, you will never return. If the Foundation interferes with Gaia, it will show less intelligence than the mule did. You might tell your ambassador that. Treviz said, Get me the coordinates, and I will be off your world at once. I will reach Gaia, and I will return. Quintessette said, I will get you the coordinates. The astronomy department works nights, of course, and I will get it for you now if I can. But let me suggest once more that you make no attempt to reach Gaia. Treviz said, I intend to make that attempt. And Quintessette said heavily, Then you intend suicide. <laughs>